Well, welcome, everybody. <laughs> That's uh, um, probably a hard act to follow. <laughs> but, but actually, we will, we don't, we'll, we're going to move seamlessly from, from the musical uh, rendition of that phrase to why we are actually here today. So I am being pulled in a new direction. <laughs> and I think I do like it because the direction of travel when it comes to treating infections caused by bacteria that are resistant needs to alter. We know that we have increasing amounts of antimicrobial resistance completely across the board. So antibiotics were, as we know, discovered in the late 20s. And increasingly, they are becoming bacteria becoming resistant towards them. So resistance was observed fairly quickly after they were actually used. But they, of course, revolutionized and continue to play an incredible part in terms of uh, modern medicine as we know it. But as we've used and abused antibiotics, both in a human context, but also in the context of... Um, of agriculture, so about 70% of all of the antibiotics that we make and manufacture are actually used in agricultural contexts. Um, this has driven the resistance of bacteria to, um, to those antimicrobials that we have. And actually it's predicted that unless we do something, by 2050 there'll be 10 million deaths a year across the globe of people dying from an infection that can't be treated. And that's not just an esoteric number, we can see this now in the most recent figures of AMR, it, it was shown that um, 1.27 million people died in 2019 from, solely from an antibiotic resistant infection. So to put that in context, about 6 million people have died from COVID. So this is already happening now. It's not something that's going to happen by 2050 unless we do something about it. But so you can see the gravity of the situation. And it, it's clear that there are, are not uh, new antimicrobials appropriately enough in the pipelines that are being developed. So if you look at the World Health Organization's most recent report from 2021, they look at the, the clinical and the preclinical pipelines. And the standard uh, antibiotics, there, there are very, very few new antibiotics coming through these pipelines, and those that are, are generally not targeting the bacteria that are resistant to already to the carbapenem and, and these, um, the antibiotics that, that, that we have already. So. Um, that there's the radio resistance too. So we have a major problem. And phages, it's, it's, it's a new direction. You can see from the way I've positioned these on, on the slides, phages were actually discovered before antibiotics. So they were discovered uh, independently by a, a Frenchman, French-Canadian in, in uh, 1917, but actually an Englishman first in, the <laughs> in 1915, Frederick Twart uh, discovered bacteriophages. Uh, but due to the, the complexity, they were just sort of considered to be too complicated to develop as an antimicrobial. Okay. So compared to a single compound that you could use that from, from an, antibi an antibiotic, phages have, have a lot more complexity in every aspect of the way that you develop them and look at them and, and use them. So this complexity was considered to be prohibitive. But um, now is the complexity that we actually need. So... Um, it is my complete pleasure to welcome you, therefore, to you today <laughs> and to this joint event that has been uh, organized by myself and Francesca Hodges. So Fran will talk about the, the networks that she runs. She runs the, the UK Phage Innovation Network. And we've, co we've designed this event to really showcase some examples of where phages are being used across different sectors. Because very often when we consider phages, we consider them specific to a sector, so human medicine or um, agriculture. But actually there can be some really interesting links where we can learn um, across the sector as to how we might use phages, also within food security. So we've also been uh, resourced uh, through the Food Security Network uh, represented today. So we coincided this event to officially launch our um, Leicester Centre for Phage Research. So uh, we're very happy to, to have this event where we have a fantastic audience of uh, doctors and scientists and regulators and government and policy makers. So it's really unusual to have this set of people in this room. So I'm, uh, I'm very excited about that. So let's actually look at where phages sit within other modalities. So we're looking for, for alternatives to antibiotics. Um, so what are, of, of which phages are one, and clearly there are other modalities, but if you look at uh, what they are, I've summarized them here just in the form of little uh, pictures, but this is the classification in the 2021 World Health Organization report. So monoclonal antibodies, yes, they, they could be a, a really good part of things, but there's only been um, 26 
uh, monoclonal antibodies identified for bacterial infections, and only five have been approved of by the FDA. So it's clearly that's not going to be a quick win in terms of new solutions to the extent of the problem. Um, microbiome modulation, again, it, it could be a really useful approach, but it, it's <laughs> even defining what a core microbiome is and then, let, then knowing how to modulate it, it, uh, it it's, a not, it's, it's, it's not easy to do this. Um, immune, immunomodulation, uh, <coughs> again, incredibly valuable um, approach, but we, we have to be quite careful when we're manipulating our immune systems to, to respond to things, but th that's obviously an active area of research as well. And the final uh, category is small molecules, so using drugs, for example, to regulate bacterial virulence. So yes, these all modalities, it's, it's important not to oversell phages, <laughs> because because clearly uh, clearly they will not be, they're, they're not, we don't want to, put to present them as they are the only answer, but they should really be seriously investigated because if we look at how phages sit and what the diversity and the number of bacteria phages, we can see that for every bacteria that we've ever studied, so this is just eight different bacteria, there are several distinct groups of completely unrelated phages that infect these bacteria. So here we can see um, each little dot here represents the bacterial genome. And, and you can just see that for all of these different species, there are discrete clusters, uh, at least uh, between 10 and 20. There's probably even more that we don't even know yet. So these are, this is a, a map of all the uh, bacteriophages that we have collectively ac across the world found. Um, and we can see that they, they exist. So all bacteria have these viruses that infect them. Um, and they infect in a multitude of, of different strategies. So by studying these bacteria, we have, we have, all, we have all these tools just out there <laughs> waiting to be discovered. And whether we end up using whole phages or engineered phages or parts of phages, so just the um, proteins that do the actual killing of the bacteria, or whether we use a mixture of those approaches remains to be remains to be seen we'll probably will use a mixture of all these different approaches but the point I'm, I'm really making is that amongst the other modalities that we have uh, to look at alternatives to antibiotics we should really seriously look at the phages because they exist and they have they, they the nature is already uh, they, they've <laughs> they're as old as bacteria uh, so we just have to try and understand them and then exploit them so the question that we really need to know is well how do you then go I've said phages are really abundant how do we go from this to this, you know, how do we actually go from picking out that, that first picture is showing you uh, bacteria, the large particles of bacteria, the little ones are phages, and how do we go from working out like which, like which of all these phages, so they're um, in, in most abundant organism on earth, which, which one do we use, and how do we actually make products for people, agriculture, aquaculture? And that's one of the reasons why we're here today. <laughs> and one of the, 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 the reasons why the uh, UK, the, the Phage Innovation Network was set up to try to link end users with phage biologists. And it's where the, within the phage center we hope to play a, uh, a role in helping these synergies to, to, to go from um, identification to product. When it comes to people, we're most likely going to need two different strands of approaches. So we need, uh, there's people who really need help now, the, the, the interest in phages has really gone from very, very low level interest to, to doctors aware that their, their patients they're treating cannot be treated with any other means. So they're really keen to get hold of phages now to treat their patients. So for the subset of, of, of so for people who have um, intractable infections at the moment, Perhaps as long as we can show that phages are safe, they're, 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 we know uh, what species, but what strains they infect. We know how we would use them, and we can show that they're not going to make anything worse. We've removed all the endotoxins. There should be a mechanism to facilitate phage use uh, under compassionate terms when those people, when, when, when there's nothing, nothing left. It's very hard to say to somebody who's essentially dying, you know, you, we need to do a clinical trial first. But clearly, we do need to do clinical trials to make phages mainstream. They should become part of mainstream medicine. So to do that in, in parallel, we can then really unpick the science. And, that's, uh, and, and we can work together as a, a community of phage researchers. We have a, a loads, lo I'm very happy that so many people from the phage community are here today because we have a fantastic uh, set of researchers in the UK for specializing in, in phages from many pathogenic bacteria. And then we can really do the work to, to figure out, well, how they attach, how they interact and kill the, the host, how to minimize resistance, and um, how will we actually optimally deliver these phages. So it is an exciting time for phage biologists in the UK. So I was very happy that James Ebden from <laughs> Brighton is, is actually here amongst the audience. I don't know where you are, James. 
Uh, there you are. So, so James pitched uh, to a government competition to the uh, Select Committee of Science and Technology that uh, so this is an annual competition. Scientists can pitch to why their subject is not being taken seriously. So he he went up before the committee and, and said, well, why aren't we investigating phages? And you can um, you can watch him <laughs> this original pitch, and you can see the other. There's a link at the bottom where we put this is the link to the to the uh, to the evidence that. Um, uh, was presented as a result of that, but you can you can also see uh, in the same channel you can see uh, James's pitch. So the, the the government launched this inquiry. They had uh, people present evidence from an academic, a clinical, and an industrial viewpoint. They had people from across the world who are using phages in different ways, and evidence from funders and regulators. Now the next step in the, of this process is a, a report is being drafted and that will go to government who then uh, will be able to uh, drive the changes in policy to embed phages into research going forward. Um, and one of the things that was really acknowledged in the evidence that was given is this complexity of phages. And so to, to, to even to, to get phages to a prototype product and translate them, it requires a lot of skills. And we've been developing <laughs> these uh, at, at Leicester University for a good uh, 15 years or, or more. So uh, these are some of uh, the key players. So there's myself, there's Andy Millard, Ed Galiov, Marie-Noël Vu, uh, and uh, Melissa Haynes and Sparrow Donakis. So essentially, we, we span even the, the skills in our critical core, we span from fundamental phage biology, phage bioinformatics. We have two clinical uh, members, uh, Mark Noel and um, Melissa Haynes. And then Ed uh, specializes in bacterial virulence and uh, Spyridon, a lot of understanding of the lung. You'll hear him, he's going to give the final uh, talk today. So essentially we have this complex set of expertise. Uh, we already have uh, been collecting phages for many, we've got a list here of all the different, some of the genera and species that we've been collecting phages for. And what we hope to do as a phage center is really um, curate the, the phage sets that we have and store also uh, phage collections from other people across the UK so that phage collections on, on um, you know, just part of short-term research projects. We'll develop standards to, to how we accurately know and assess bacteria phages and how we work with them. Um, and the, the phage center, actually, the formalization of our phage center came about through a university competition. They, they called for uh, uh, a competition to, who, to, to centers where they would specialize in uh, and, and support specific expertise. So we were lucky enough to be supported in, in, that, uh, in that call. And part of what we'll do in the Phage Centre as well is really educate the next generation of phage biologists. So we have a, a whole a stream of people. We, our lab is a sort of a hive of activity generally from... At the moment we have uh, somebody from Belgium and uh, uh, we've had a, an American academic who sadly leaves us tomorrow. Rodney King has been brilliant to have in, in our lab. But we, we have a, a whole uh, set of, of people come through our lab to learn expertise. And why, why Leicester? Well, we are in the heart of the, of the country, <laughs> so it hopefully hasn't taken you too, too long here to uh, get to here, those of you who've travelled. So I've, I summarised here, you can see these are the things we already have, the resources we've been developing and what we hope to do. But what's really key is that we need to be able to get to the point where we do clinical trials on phages. We have a good clinical trial unit. We fit really in well with our NIHR-funded um, uh, respiratory theme of, of, of looking at biomedical research. Uh, we have uh, interest from people interested in critical care. We also nestle in with lots of other centers. So we, ha we have a center for, um, for microbiology and infectious disease, for precision health. We have brilliant structural biology here at Leicester. Um, so clearly as we develop that mechanistic understanding of phages, we need to understand how they actually work at, at that level. So we'll tap in more and more, we'll, we'll synergize with the starting to do projects with, with, um, with that center. And then we have mathematical modeling and the cultural landscape. So it's not just the complexity within phage biologists. Because the, 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 the question I most commonly ask is, well, if phages are so good, why aren't they you? What, you know, what do you need to do? <laughs> well, it's complicated and we need these levels of expertise and people to work together to translate phage products. So just on my last slide, uh, I wanted just to summarize where I think as a phage community, uh, we, we can work together to, uh, to, to really help progress the translation of phages. So there's clearly going to be a lot of work on the mechanistic understanding and 
and the uh, this standardization of well-understood models that we can test our phages in. And then there's going to be a, a, a piece of work on where is it best to use phages. So we know that a lot of the antimicrobial resistance that we get actually starts off in animals. So we, we know there's transmission from the, the, the antimicrobial resistant bacteria build up in the, in the, the poultry or the, or the other animals that we consume, um, and then those, those bacteria uh, then infect us. So is it going to be better to, where, where do we target the animals, where do we target the humans? So, so working out where we will use phages, as well as what bacterial species we should focus on. And then how are we going to, who, who is actually going to do that translation? So the public-private private sector partnerships, can there be more sort of social enterprise models to get phages used within the NHS? And we, ha we actually have that advantage in our, in our country in that we have a, 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 a free point of care healthcare system. And then there's clearly the gaps, and these, these were identified in, in that uh, government inquiry, but we have major gaps in our purification and our production and our understanding of regulation and how that fits in. So I think all of these themes will be picked up in our panel discussions today and we can unpick them and find good ways to go forward. So it just remains for me to uh, say so yes, I, I do feel I'm being pulled in this new direction. <laughs> I think I like it and I think that uh, <laughs> I hope that, that you do too. And um, I look forward to a very, uh, it should be a, a great day of, of, of talks and discussions on this topic. So it just remains for me to thank the members of our lab. And uh, <laughs> yeah, this was us uh, in, in a local uh, alpaca farm uh, Christmas, on our Christmas outing. Some of these alpacas were slightly wild. <laughs> I've got whole sets of amusing photographs of our, our whole team being uh, pulled in very di many, many directions, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Not necessarily dictated by the human. Um, and I thank very much my, my collaborators, of, of which um, I mean, we wouldn't be here without the, the support of uh, bioinformaticians from uh, uh, Copenhagen. From we have uh, work uh, closely with other um, organisations. So, so uh, for example, Pages for Global Health, um, I work very closely with. So that just remains me to yeah. Thank you very much uh, for your attention, and uh, I will introduce the next speaker now. <laughs> so it is now, uh, it's really great to be able to welcome James Webb. I don't know where. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I'm thinking of the James Webb telescope. <laughs> it must be the space influence at the, at the beginning. Sorry, Stephen. So, yeah, it's, it's great to. It's, so, Stephen is the uh, antimicrobial lead for UKRI. Wow. Oh, oh. Yeah, and uh, and he's going to tell us a, a lot more about the context so that I've been uh, that I started to introduce. So thank, thank you, you very much. I presume the slides are on there. Yes, I think they could be incorrect. Yeah. Thank you. So thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, our strategic themes, the context uh, in which we're funding uh, a large AMR flagship over the coming years. So in the last spending review, um, we were uh, given money to allocate to some strategic themes which are particularly complex and require work across all disciplines uh, to really tackle them. So we have five strategic themes which we'll be funding over the next five years, uh, which the one that we're particularly interested in here is tackling infections. Um, but you may, I mean, there is some interface with the other strategic themes and they may also be relevant to you. So, tackling infections, um, we want to basically bolster our natural defence uh, and response capabilities by tackling infectious diseases that are an issue not just for people, but for animals, for plants, uh, and across our environment in much more integrated ways, um, and particularly, therefore, epidemic preparedness and tackling AMR. Uh, so the challenge is that infectious disease threats are becoming much more complex and challenging, particularly uh, given that we have all these other global challenges at the same time, loss of biodiversity, climate change, etc. Um, and the UK government has made various commitments internationally, and now it's time for UKRI to put its money uh, where the government um, has said that we are going to make these commitments. So within research, uh, UKRI's view is that the landscape across human, animal, and plant health is, is not as integrated and coordinated as it could be. Um, and so this is an opportunity to build on our current strengths across the UK 
uh, and to capitalise particularly on what we learnt during the COVID-19 pandemic when we had a rapid response calls. So we have uh, an ambition for a very holistic um, research and innovation agenda that brings together the UK and international partners, that brings together academia, policy makers, industry, civil society more widely, um, brings together animal health, plant health and human health, brings together all these different aspects um, and whether it's therapeutics, whether it's diagnostics, etc., and have a really um, integrated means of tackling these major challenges. So now the nitty gritty. So as I said, we've got 75 million pounds um, allocated over the five years, 2022 to 27. Um, and in the first phase, there's 20 million going to epidemic preparedness, and there's 10 million pounds going to the um, AMR flagship, which is what I'm leading on behalf of UKRI. So we have 10 million pounds over these five years, plus we may get additional money leveraged from industry and government. Um, and as I said, it's particularly to build capacity in the community to, to tackle this challenge. Uh, and then we are also spending money to augment existing funding streams where it would be beneficial, particularly where they're um, to enable additional disciplines to take part or, whether, or where additional funding, um, for instance, to international programs would benefit um, the tackling infections agenda. And then we're sort of going to take stock in a phase two and identify what particular gaps we have and um, decide what exactly we're going to spend the rest of the money on. But we will sort of learn lessons over the next couple of years before um, committing to exactly what we spend that money on. So in the AMR flagship, um, our ambition is to connect and expand the UK research communities and to facilitate evidence-based decision-making um, across our non-academic stakeholders as well as academic uh, stakeholders. So our view is that at the moment we have a lot of researchers in our different disciplines who are really working in silos. And I, this is not altogether a, a bad thing. There are many questions that need dedicated um, just that single discipline working on them. But we have other um, funding mechanisms that can be used to do that research that already exists. This, the purpose of this is to grow an AMR community that involves all disciplines and not only that, it connects them, uh, there are too much in silos at the moment, and also expands them. There are loads of people out there who have the skills and expertise that would be really valuable for tackling AMR but don't necessarily realise it and we want to bring them in um, to this research field. So what we have planned in a first phase, uh, so this is, a, this is our pipeline for delivering AMR solutions. So we are spending three million pounds on networks. We're looking to fund around five or six networks that will be national networks covering the whole of the UK. And we'd like to cover as much of the AMR field as possible. Um, and they will bring together academia across all the disciplines represented by UKRI councils. Um, with practice, practitioners, whether that's clinicians in hospitals or farmers or um, whatever, whether it's uh, policy makers both in and out of government and with business. And they will, those networks will disperse very small grants to build collaborations between academic and non-academic stakeholders. And this is particularly important to build trust between people that haven't worked together before. Um, there's very little risk then for industry, for example, to get involved in working with somebody if the amount of time and money required is very small. And then the members of those networks will be eligible to um, apply for the remaining seven million pounds of grants, um, plus any additional leverage we get um, in the second phase. Um, and there'll be a combination of sort of medium-sized grants and larger grants, reflecting the fact that different parts of the AMR community are at different maturities. Um, so I would say the sort of antifungal resistance in crops community is a very different position from the antibiotic resistance in human health community. Um, so there'll be yeah, different sizes of grants available and we would expect those to effectively be developed by the networks, but there'll be, it's a competitive process. Uh, and we would also like those networks 
to build collaborations that can then apply for grants through our other funding opportunities. So um, not only at our existing funding opportunities, like our responsive mode council-specific programs, um, but also we do, for example, have a UK-India farmed animal health program currently open, and we have a UK-China um, AMR program currently open as well. Um, but we'll also be launching across UKRI the interdisciplinary responsive mode pilot scheme later this year, and um, we would expect these networks to be in a great position to develop proposals to put forward to that. So the first stage of what we're doing are a series of community meetings. The first one's in Birmingham tomorrow. Some of you may be going. Uh, and there's then an online one next Monday and one in Edinburgh following Thursday. Um, and the idea of these is to bring together, this is the first stage of bringing together people who don't necessarily know each other already, get them talking, developing their ideas. Um, they've already submitted loads of potential ideas for networks. Um, and that's great. We have around 80 ideas that have been submitted, but we need to sort of bring them down into sort of five or six networks that cover, well, ultimately that are funded, that cover as much of the um, AMR field as possible. And we want these to be, perhaps it's a bit different from your usual UKRI entirely competitive grant funding round. These are a little bit more collaborative. Uh, so it will be competitive to ensure quality, but um, we'd expect the applications to be much more collaborative than is perhaps usually the case. Um, and the networks that are ultimately funded, we want them to cover you know, as much as possible of humans, animals, plants, the environment, et cetera, um, bacteria, fungi, et cetera, different environments, um, and to collaborate together on areas of common interest. So that's our plan. We've received a lot of support, particularly from um, government stakeholders that are quite excited because we haven't done anything like this for some time, um, and I hope well, it looks like from the number of people who have registered for our meetings, which shows just over 350, that we're perhaps doing the right thing. So um, I look forward to the rest of this process. Um, I will be here all day, so if you've got any questions on it, please feel free to come and ask me. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. We'll do uh, questions as part of the panel uh, discussion. So, but yeah, th thank you for, for painting that uh, landscape. And now it's um, a pleasure to introduce to you uh, Francesca Hodges from the Phage Innovation Network. She's going to explain what the network will do and um, a little bit of background to the, the structure of the organization. Thank you very much, Martha. Um, so hello everyone, it's my absolute pleasure to be here today um, and to be able to put on this event uh, in partnership with the Food Safety Research Network and uh, the University of Leicester Centre for Phage Research to celebrate the launch of the centre um, and to showcase the exceptional phage research and development that's going on in the UK. Um, it's particularly poignant for me to bring it here as I spent many, many hours of my life just up the road in the Morris Shock building, isolating and characterising my own phages um, uh, for, quite, for quite a wide variety of applications, actually. Um, and in fact, the image on the background here was um, taken at the University of Leicester's EM facility, and I know Nat's presenting a poster, so go and have a look at it. <laughs> there you <are>, Nat. <laughs> um, so anyway, extra special for me to be standing here in front of you all today. Um, and to be telling you about the work that we're doing um, at uh, Innovate UK KTN to support um, and help develop uh, the phage community in the UK. So to start, I just want to give a brief background on Innovate UK KTN. Um, so KTN is part of the Innovate UK group. So Innovate UK itself is the UK's innovation agency. They are non-departmental public body operating at arm's length from the government um, as part of UK uh, research and innovation. Um, so KTN exists within the Innovate UK group to connect researchers and innovators with uh, new partners and opportunities um, and help accelerate ideas. Um, I'm a knowledge transfer manager on the Emerging Technologies and Industries team at KTN, and I lead the Phage Innovation Network that we launched earlier this year. So uh, through our event today, uh, we really wanted to showcase the breadth and variety of different applications that phage-based technologies can be used for across multiple sectors. So the sessions we have scheduled today each have a different theme for phage use, and within each session, our wonderful speakers will be telling you about their successes in the development of phage-based technologies. Um, however, something that I often get asked in, in my role 
is if they're just so great and they can do all these amazing things, then why aren't we using them already? Um, and it's really quite a complicated question to answer, but I think has lots of social, economic, and political reasons having influenced the development of, uh, of the use of phage in the West throughout history. Um, but I think really it comes down to the fact that, at least in the UK, uh, we've not had a sustained opportunity or sustained resource to effectively demonstrate their utility. And ultimately, the need for them has never been as great as it is now. So antibiotics are or were so effective and easy to produce and the same goes for other chemical antimicrobials and so it made sense to use these for applications that phage could potentially also be helpful in too. Um, but now we're facing multiple global challenges uh, including food safety and security, water pollution, uh, the spread of antimicrobial resistance and even climate change, all of which are demanding innovative sustainable solutions to monitoring or removing bacteria. So if given, if given the opportunity with the right support and engagement from key stakeholders, uh, the UK phage community and wider phage community, in, uh, wide, wider scientific community in the UK, has the breadth of knowledge and depth, depth of ex expertise to uh, contribute to addressing all of these challenges and to have a huge impact on the development of phage-based technologies for global reach um, and also to bring positive change to the sector. So um, at KTN, our mission is to connect ideas, people, and communities to respond to national and even global challenges and drive positive change through innovation. So in recognition of the, poten of the expertise and potential um, that the UK phage sector has, KTN has established the Phage Innovation Network. So I just want to go through a few of the impacts we're working towards with the Phage Innovation Network. Um, we launched in February of this year, um, so we've only had a couple of months. <laughs> so I'm not saying that we've delivered these yet, this is just our plan. <laughs> um, so we want to uni unite key stakeholders within the phage community and from other supporting areas to provide a unified voice and direction for the phage sector in the UK. We want to understand emerging innovations and the development of phage-based technologies because the more we understand about these technologies and the different ways they can be used, the clearer our communications with regulators and policymakers will be, which will make our actions more constructive. We want to improve cross-sector access to phage-based technologies. So, for example, by working to clarify regulatory pathways, we can start to elucidate routes to market and improve, improve access to phage-based technologies for applications across different sectors. We want to create a business community around innovations in phage research for sector growth and economic benefit in the UK. So through this network, we aim to build a platform from which the UK knowledge base uh, for phage research can be expanded, allowing the UK to solidify itself as a world leader in the development of phage-based technologies. And finally, we want to change perceptions of anti-infectives and their role in society. We want to work towards redefining antimicrobials as infrastructure necessary for global health and economic security. So in pursuit of our intended impacts, we spent the first few months of activity elucidating key actions um, that need to be carried out in order to progress the development of phage-based technologies in the UK. So this work has been done with the support of Innovate UK and the Food Safety Research Network and has involved consultation from phage experts with uh, uh, the wider microbiology and AMR communities, um, specialists from different industries interested in the use of phages, um, regulators, policymakers, and funders. And we've also included learnings from researchers and companies about um, approaches to phage R&D in countries outside of the UK in this work too. So some of the key actions um, that have been highlighted through our work so far are listed here, and it's our intention to compile and make publicly available a uh, report on these suggested actions. Um, and these are not all actions that we can carry out through the Innovation Network. I only have so many hours in a day. Um, but that's the point about bringing everybody together. Um, but we're looking to work with the necessary stakeholders who can help facilitate these actions, and I think movement... Um, with the establishment of the Vesta Phage Centre and uh, the promise it, and the tackling infections theme um, for UKRI um, really aligns very, nice, very nicely with this, um, this action. Um, uh, so one thing uh, I think is particularly important is um, the first point in this slide, uh, which is formulation of a national strategy. So for us to be able to deliver phage-based technologies, we need to be clear on a national scale how they can be used where they can be used, and why they should be used in the place of alternative options. Um, and in doing this, we aim to provide focus for the UK in the development of phage technologies. And ultimately, we're working towards creating policy, regulatory, and business environments that are prepared for and can enable antimicrobial innovation. 
So just a quick presentation from me, but I'm going to leave it there for today. Um, if you'd like to have a chat about the work we're doing, please feel free to send me an email or come talk to me today. I'm always happy to chat about Fayette Phages, um, and thank you all for listening. Thank you, Fran. Um, so now it's a, a great pleasure to introduce Andy. Andy Millard uh, uh, is going to really talk to you about the, the question of, of timeliness. So I said in my talk, the phages were discovered in 1915. We had no concept even of a gene at that point. <laughs> There's so much we can do now um, on the back of understanding phage genomics. And Andy is going to give you a quick whiz through what that is. Thank you, Martha. So I'm going to give a quick introduction to bacteriophage uh, genomics and how this may ba help phage-based technologies. Uh, so if anyone is playing phage bingo, that are things that you hear at common phage conferences. Martha beat me to the first one. She already told you that the most abundant biological entities on the planet, estimated to be 10 to 31 in the biosphere, 10 to 23 infections per second, huge numbers of them. So what do we know about them? Well, phages at the most simple form are a capsid of protein. Uh, proteins aren't too interesting. And then we have DNA inside where we have the genomes. This can either be um, RNA or DNA. So even though they're hugely abundant, in terms of what we know about their genomes, we know very little. They contain a huge number of genes that have unknown function. You find a new phage, you'll find a gene that's probably not been found before. We have no idea what they do. 20% of nucleotides on Earth are thought to be from viruses. The majority are back, thought to be bacteriophages. Yet if we go to NCBI, only 1% of nucleotides have come from a virus or a bacteriophage. So they're largely understudied at the nucleotide level. So phage genomics got off to a good start. The first one was MS2, an RNA virus that was sequenced, and then 1977, and Sanger started sequencing Phyx-174. From that point on, Lambda and T7 started to be sequenced. And if we look what happened over time, the reason this starts in 1985, for those that aren't aware, younger people in the audience, there was no gem bank at one point, so it didn't come into existence until 1985, when they all got put in the same point. Then there was a huge increase in the number of phage genomes over time. So this all looks very good. We monitor this uh, through an infrared database that uh, one of my students uh, developed at the number of genomes and tried to do some quality control. So we can see in the last few years, these numbers have vastly increased. Uh, we look at both the total number of genomes and unique genomes. The reason for the peak is because sometimes people submit things that they call phages and they aren't, so we take them out after. So we're now at about 26,000 genomes. So that sounds a large number of isolated phages, but if you put that into context of everything else, We've got, what, a quarter of a million human genomes that have been sequenced. We have 300,000 complete, uh, sorry, 300,000 representative bacterial genomes. There's over 300,000 salmonella genomes alone, and we have 26,000 phage genomes, which are hugely diverse. So what can we tell from these? So in the early um, days of phage therapy, uh, when Durrell first found these phages and used them to to um, treat dysentery. At that point, he wasn't even aware they were a phage, so they definitely didn't have TEM pictures of them. As um, phage therapy developed uh, in Russia and Georgia, there was some characterization. There's very deep phenotypic characterization of them, but much of the early work um, was had in terms of what we knew about them was based on morphology. So the morphology of them is great. You see lots of different phages. You have long tails, you have short tails, you have fat tails, you have curly tails, big heads, slightly less big heads. But that's just morphology. It doesn't really reflect the total diversity of phages. So with genomics, we can now do this. So this is the total sequenced isolated phage sphere, as it were. Um, these colours, so this is a network graph, so where you see colours, things that are the same colour grouped together are what is now being classified as a genus. So these are phages that have about 70% nucleotide identity. There is now 
huge numbers of genera that I can't remember and everyone is in the audience, so I'm not going to get the number wrong. But there's more genera than there is colours that we can visually see, which is why we have the same colours. A lot of these phages are very different from each other. So we now have some quite clear rules to um, how we can put phages into bins or into groups. And we can call that taxonomy. And thanks to uh, Dan Turner and Evelyn who have led this work with the ICTV, we now have really clear cutoffs. So we can have phages that anything above 95% A and I uh, across 100% of the genome is the same species. Above 70%, we call it the same genus. And then we can go further up the tree, but we're just going to focus on these main two to start with. So we can now look at this diversity and try and get an understanding of what we know about bacteriophages. So the first thing is a lot of the data we have, or almost all of the data we have, is biased. So 75% of the total phages that have ever been isolated have come from just 30 bacterial genera. And in some cases, it's even more extreme. So if uh, Mycobacterium smegmatis, for example, has thousands of phages isolated against it. And this introduces some bias into the data and how we interpret this. If you ever want to find a new phage species, go and find a bacteria that nobody's isolated phage against, and I can pretty much guarantee you will find a new species, probably a new family. There's a huge amount of diversity that we're still discovering in them. But what can we do with this diversity, and why do we need to understand it? So Eve, the research that we, has been done to date has shown that if you take phages that are genomically and functionally diverse, you can systematically design phage cocktails that are better than phages that are similar in some instances. So understanding this diversity is going to help us divide, design better phage cocktails if you're going down the phage therapy route in terms of applications. And there's a nice example of this um, from this group that uh, showed the systematic design of phages. So what else might we want to do with it? So this is, uh, we're now looking at a group of phages that were uh, called T4-like. So the T4 is a classic phage. Um, these have now been split, split up into different genera. So each of these bubbles, uh, so this is a phage clouds program. So each of these bubbles represents a genus. So that means all these phages within a particular bubble are about 70% nucleotide identity or higher. And what we can see is we have bubbles with different colors in, and some bubbles are all exactly the same co color. In this instance, the colors are linked to the host. So we find uh, like this set over here, where they're all the same color. I can't remember the host off the top of my head. But if we look at this one here, Hiding in the background is a light blue in the sea of green. So the green in this case is Escherichia, and I think the light blue is Yersinia. So we have phages that are very similar, but infect different hosts. And we can look at lots and lots of groups of different phages and find this pattern. And by mining this data, somewhere hidden in the genome is the understanding of how these phages infect different hosts. But what we really need is more phenotypic data and more genomes to link these two things together. So we can start to see the patterns, but when we only have one that infects, we need more data, which is probably going to become a theme of my talk. So some groups have taken this further, and I think this was published last month. There's a really uh, nice study where they started to understand how phages infect different strains of Klebsiella and pneumonia. And they can now link this to genomic data. So they had a, I think they had approximately 50 phages and 150 hosts. And by sequencing both of them and then looking for determinants, one of the biggest things that linked them was genomic data and, in fact, the depolymerase genes that were found within them. So by looking at a single gene, they could predict with high accuracy what these phages might infect. So this is great for Klebsiella pneumoniae, and, and it seems to work really well. We know if you go and look at E. coli, this is not going to work anywhere near as well. And again, what we need is far more genotypic and phenotypic data linking these two things together from well-curated sets that allow you to go to a phage genome or go to a new isolate and be able to predict how it might help you have a better cocktail or whether or not it's going to be of use in therapy. 
So what else does genomics tell you? So one of the big worries about um, using bacteriophages, antibiotic resistance genes, and the transfer or using phages that carry antibiotic resistance genes. So why we should always check for this, the chances of finding them is actually very small. So about 0.3% of phages have them. For the vast majority that do have them are temperate phages. And temperate phages are generally not preferred for phage therapy, so aren't going to be used anyway. But we can look for other things, such as virulence factors or virulence genes, so it might carry a toxin. Again, we see a big split between them. So lytic phages tend not to have them, which are often preferred, but they're far higher in temperate phages. But the type of temperate phages that have them also differs. So 5.5% overall, but it's 20% in streptococcus phages. And again, this is biased slightly by the data that we have. So there's lots of ways of looking for these different um, factors. Uh, phage leads, abrogate card, lots of different programs. They all do different things. I would say phage leads is the best, but I'm biased. That's, they all do exactly the same thing. It's just we develop that. Other things that we can look for are um, people are very worried about, understandably, about horizontal gene transfer. So phages can be transducing phages, and they can move genes from one thing to the other. And these you want to avoid. And again, genomics can help in this context. So previously, some uh, groups have found a phage called SUSP1 and SUSP2 which were super-spreading phages. And what they found is they increased antibiotic resistance gene transfer by about 1,000-fold. So there was only two of these phages at the time, and they know they move genes about, and you generally want to avoid them. As we get more genomes, we can see that we have these phages, and at this level, it's at the species level. So we can now go down to 95%. And if anything is similar to th these two phages, you probably don't want to use them based on their genomic data because you don't want to be moving um, genes because it's not going to just be antibiotic resistance genes they move. Any kind of DNA can be moved. So we can start to use genomics to exclude these phages in the future. But again... We need more phenotypic data. We need the well-characterized phage sets so we understand how they transduce things, how frequently, and we can link that to genomic data through databases and then um, draw better conclusions or predictions. The same things apply for lytic and uh, temperate phages. So temperate phages are those that can integrate and form a prophage. We want to try and avoid them in phage therapy in lots of applications. So again... One of the ways to do this is use the genomic data. You can look for particular genes, or you can look for signatures of them. One of the issues that arises from our predictions at the moment is that 54% of um, temperate phages that have been sequenced and isolated and shown to be functional as temperate come from just three um, genera of bacteria. And actually, 25% of them come from Mycobacterium smegmatis. So our understanding of the genomics of temperate phages is largely based on Mycobacterium smegmatis that was actually isolated on a strain that has been evolved to make it easy to try and move DNA into. So it's probably not representative. So we also need better models and broader um, sets of phages. And yet again, more genotypic and more phenotypic data. So we can keep going at this level. We can keep looking at phages and looking at differences between them. So, and the last example, I'm just going to look at some phages called SPFM phages. So you may hear a little bit more about these from Anisha later, who uh, did a lot of this work in Martha's lab. So these SPFM phages, um, they're all greater than 99% ANI. So they're all very, very similar. They've been shown to be very effective as a cocktail, which you might hear about. But what was interesting about these phages, so this graph here, so this is temperature, this is PFU, and these two, all these other colours are different SPFM phages. It doesn't matter about their names. But what stood out is that SPFM 10 and SPFM, that's a mouthful, 17, 10 and 17 were more resistant to higher heat which was actually important there in that application when they were doing spray drying. And they were, had, uh, they were more sensitive to a lower pH. So now we're getting to the point where we've got complete genomes, very few SNPs, and we can get down to the point 
where there is only two genes that have differences, so two proteins may be causing these differences. So we can then start to go and look at larger data sets and try and investigate why we still need to work out the mechanism of what this is, by, but again, by comparing the um, genotypic data to the phenotypic data, we can try and get an understanding of why some phages are better in systems and rationally design systems rather than being blind to having a long tail and a big head. So there's lots and lots of other applications of phages. So you can deliver cargo, add colicin, surfactants, people add CRISPR-Cas systems. Um, you can remove problematic genes through engineering. You can remove the people who have removed repressors. People have removed integrases. You can start to engineer phages, and people have done this um, with COVID to try and use them as vaccines. You can use reporter phages by putting GFP on them. So when they bind to the cell, you can see the GFP or RFP. But all of this requires a detailed understanding of the phage genome. So in summary, um, bacteriophages, uh, they're hugely diverse. We've only just really begin to look at them. The phage genomes are going to underpin a lot of the new technologies, but complementing the phenotypic data. And it's bringing these two things together that's going to be really crucial to the understanding. Uh, and if I hadn't already said a hundred times, we probably need more data <laughs> and high-quality, ordered, standardized data so we compare like for like rather than apples and oranges. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Andy. And as Andy said, e even a few years ago, it was much harder to get all that data. So now we're going to move seamlessly on to, <laughs> I'm going to hand you over to Matt Gilmore from the Food Safety Network, who's going to introduce our first panel, which is going to be about the use of phages in agricultural settings. Thanks, Martha. Uh, thanks for hosting us here in Leicester. Congratulations on the opening of the new uh, Phage Center. Uh, my name is uh, Matt Gilmore here on behalf of the Food Safety Research Network. It's actually a UKRI funded network. Uh, so Stephen, I'll see you in, in Birmingham tomorrow. Uh, but it's a network that, that's founded on, on brokering partnerships between academic researchers, uh, food businesses, and government departments. Uh, we're about a year into our programming and, and when, we, when we launched uh, one of the first activities that we had to do was actually find out what were the problems we're solving by us as a food safety research network. And one of the, the biggest signals that we got, especially from food businesses, was bacteriophage. Uh, so these are, these are food producers, these are food retailers. And, and frankly, after, after a few decades of experiencing things like salmonella, listeria, campylobacter in, in food products, they're a little frustrated that despite all their great efforts with the cleaning and disinfection, so their chemical plans, they're still finding these organisms within, within their food. So these are, these are, these are risks that are passed on directly uh, to their customers, to consumers, and of course this is not what food businesses want. Um, so they're looking for novel solutions, and this is where the interest in uh, bacteriophage came up, because this could be something that actually dampens down or changes the transmission of these organisms um, within, whether it's farm settings, whether it's in food production settings, Whatever can limit their, 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 their spill over into foods was certainly desired. Um, so uh, for the rest of the day, we're actually going to have kind of thematic discussions. So we're going to have three panel discussions. Uh, this first one is on food safety. Uh, we'll transition over to animal health and then human health uh, to close out the day. Uh, but in terms of our food safety panel, what we're going to have is two speakers. Uh, so Alison Blackwell from APS Biocontrol uh, and then George Aldrich from uh, University of Leicester here. And then we're going to form a panel discussion uh, with Will Green from the National Biofilms uh, Innovation Center, uh, Evelyn Adriessens, my colleague from Quadrum, um, and then also Kath Rees from the University of Nottingham. Uh, so we'll have a bit of plenary. Uh, we'll have a little bit of Q&A that I'll direct to the panel. Uh, but then we're going to try and leave at least 10 minutes of, of questions for you, the audience, to, uh, to pose to the panel. Uh, so think of those as the, as the uh, presentations are going on. Um, and Allison's unfortunately not able to join in person today. Uh, so. Um, just need a little bit of help with logistics on how I get her connected in. Perfect. Fran, let's hit uh, start then, please. Hello. I'm Alison Blackwell, CEO of APS Biocontrol Limited, based in Dundee. I'd like to spend the next around 15 minutes providing an outline of our work developing bacteriophage solutions for fresh produce. This will include the support that we've received from Innovate UK, 
the commercial and academic collaborations that have been made possible through the support, in addition to the many challenges met along the way. The issues being addressed are the financial and reputational damages caused by bacterial spoilage pathogens throughout the fresh produce supply chain. For example, this is blackleg disease in a potato plant caused by a selection of Pectobacterium species, and these are the associated rotting tubers causing yield losses, and if they don't develop until in store, they can contribute to depot and shelf life failures. Bacterial rots are the single most important reason for customer complaints about fresh produce to supermarkets. Globally, soft rots are responsible for losses to the potato industry alone of £750 million. In other sectors, bacterial blotch of mushrooms can result in 10% of industry losses, and the UK's onion sector estimates that bacterial infections are responsible for annual losses of around £9 million. Here's an onion suffering from soft rot caused by Burkholderia species bacteria, with the rots often not visible externally, but only realised when the onion is cut in half. This bacterial breakdown is of particular significance where harvested crops are stored for some months, such as onions, with the industry then having to rely on foreign imports for a period of the year to meet customer demands. There are no specific antibacterial plant protection products available and an ever narrowing choice of mainstream agrochemicals. This is due to a combination of resistance development and product withdrawals due to concerns of residues and environmental impact. At APS Biocontrol, we are actively addressing these spoilage problems with carefully selected groups of bacteriophage, working from protecting seeds at planting, the growing crop, and all the way through to post-harvest solutions. The wider challenges of being addressed are key. Reducing food waste, making production more energy efficient, will make a positive contribution towards net zero goals. In addition, through developing a biological approach, we are reducing the impact of pesticide use and providing growers with a new tool to use in integrated pest management programmes. Also, by extending storage times, the technology is allowing UK growers to become more resilient and regain some of the current import trade. So while we're using bacteriophage, you're all very aware of the abundance of bacteriophage, providing a mainly untapped antimicrobial resource to be harvested and applied in key sectors. We believe that bacteriophage have significant potential to contribute to improving the UK and wider food security. So what makes bacteriophage so potentially very good as biocontrol products for plant protection compared with existing agrochemicals and biopesticides? Firstly, they are safe and naturally occurring in the pathogen's own environment. This, together with the high levels of specificity, means that the risks for non-target organisms and the environment are reduced to virtually zero. They are also applicable to both organic and mainstream agriculture. Finally, whereas chemical products ox oxidise very quickly following deployment, bacteriophage will remain active for much longer. We also have some very nice data showing that they will move into and around plants to reach their target pathogens. Biological plant protection products are seeing a growing market opportunity and the biopesticide market is predicted to be worth $10 billion by 2026, representing a 15% annual growth rate. Along with their environmental benefits, many biopesticides are registered as low risk actives, meaning reduced data requirements and hence reducing the overall costs involved for development and registration compared with an estimated $286 million for a typical agrochemical. Bacteriophage are able to address this biocontrol opportunity along with wider challenges. And these include the legislative and grow requirements for chemical alternatives, growing consumer demands for safer food and increasing regulatory challenges relating to residues, secondary metabolites and environmental impact. Quick company summary. APS is based in Dundee over the Tay Bridge and home to both the v &A Museum here in the background and also the Discovery Ship. This was built and launched from Dundee in 1901 with the first mission to the Antarctic with Robert Scott and Ernest Shackleton. We also have frequent penguin visitors. APS has its own dedicated building with labs and offices and our phage R&D sits alongside our entomological work, including producing and marketing our Smidge brand of insect control products.
APS has a core team of molecular and microbial research scientists working in all aspects of bacteriophage biology. We had the skills and resources to follow a project through from conception through to commercialization. From the initial pathogen isolations, bacteriophage isolations through environmental enrichments and host range assessments to produce phage mixes to give optimal pathogen coverage. Through to both morphological and genomic characterization, manufacture and finally commercialization processes. Our biolized technology has resulted in a pipeline of phage products against key economically important plant pathogens, both in the UK and across Europe, with a focus on keeping the growing plant disease free to reduce later risks of bacterial breakdown in store or on the supermarket shelf. Being perhaps a pioneer in this sector, we have experienced numerous challenges to progress the technology towards a point where it can be commercialised and I'd like to briefly review some of these many challenges and our current solutions. Finance has been a key challenge to us. Bacteriophage are a relatively unproven technology in the commercial world, significantly reducing the pool of private investors willing to get involved with the risks involved. And whilst many agrochemical companies are keen to expand their biocontrol portfolio, they often have the view that bacteriophage may only be applicable to niche markets due to their specificity and that, of course, there is still a long way to go to a sellable product. Our solution has been to supplement our own company profits with public sector funding. We are very grateful for significant support from Innovate UK, and I've also received funding from the Scottish Government, Scottish Enterprise, and have been involved in multi-partner EU-funded phage projects. Industry opinion has also been a challenge that had to be addressed very early on. Growers are wary of new products, particularly biological ones, and the concept of spraying viruses onto their crops appeared alien to many at first. Early on, we realised that it was essential to fully understand our market, identifying those opportunities within sectors that had real requirements for a solution to bacterial spoilage. It was also clear that it was essential to establish partnerships with key companies within the relevant supply chain, including growers, agronomists, processors and the customers for the crops, both small and large. These are just some of the industry partners we have worked with to develop bacteriophage solutions, many through Innovate UK funding. This has included significant support for our work on blackleg, a devastating bacterial disease of high value seed potato crops, which can progress all the way through the sector, often realised as rots impact produce on the supermarket shelf and in your homes. Along with Branston, Agrico and other partners, Innovate funding has enabled us to run sequential phage treatment trials with seed potatoes since 2018, giving us five years of valuable field data. We've also had good support from technical leads from the large multiples, such as Tesco, who can provide an important pull through for the technology for the growers. Innovate UK funding has also allowed us to address key technical challenges where we have perhaps lacked sufficient expertise or resources within the company. Answering questions such as, how do receptor binding proteins relate to phage specificity? The best approaches for morphological and genomic characterization. Do phage move into and through plants? Can we assess phage efficacy, not only in the field, but in more controlled glasshouse environments? And what impact might phage application have on the normal plant microbiome? Our solution has, has been to form good collaborations with universities and research institutes. Um, and many of these, of course, have been enabled through Innovate UK funding. These are just a few of our recent academic collaborators. Ian Toth at JHI and David Kenyon at SASA have been involved throughout our work developing our potato blackleg solutions, involving looking at phage movement through plants and differences depending on potato variety. Rebecca Weisser at Cardiff University is a current collaborator on an exciting new project working with the onion in industry, bringing her experience of working with clinical bacterial pathogens to address plant protection challenges. We have worked with Martha's team at Leicester on a variety of projects with a focus on phage characterisation, although we did also have a field trip to Turkey on a mission to clean up drying vine fruits from salmonella con contamination. 
Finally, Rob Jackson at Reading, now in Birmingham, and Rob Levine at Leuven were key partners in a very exciting um, EU Horizon 2020 project, um, looking at a number of very uh, interesting EU plant pathogens. And we have an ongoing collaboration with Villa at the University of York, involving formulation of his lab's phages. Phage commercialisation is still the biggest challenge, certainly in the UK and Europe. Issues that we have addressed have included IPR protection with our phage mixes and their applications all patented. We're also concerned about scale up processes and the associated energy requirements for cold storage with impacts on space requirements and with possible geographical restrictions concerning distribution and use. One approach has been to look at dried formulations and through an Innovate UK Smart project, we were able to work with IRS Bio, a company that specialises in creating thermally stable virus preparations, to create tableted versions of our phage mixes, which are showing good promise as an alternative means of both storing and transporting phage products. However, regulatory approval still remains the biggest challenge. Approval as a plant protection product is a costly and long process. Five years is the minimum time period for both an active substance and product approval, assuming no significant hitches along the way. However, phage don't fit the standard microbial guidelines, which automatically presents a problem to the regulators, who also happen to have a little knowledge about bacteriophage and tend to be very wary about them mainly associated with their potential to pick up and transfer deleterious genes from the host bacteria. Another problem we have is that plant protection products are also registered as single entities, whereas of course we need a mix of bacteriophage to manage the pathogen variability and specificity. Our solution has been many years of discussion with the regulators, including involvement in the preparation of a new OECD guidance document for registering phage as plant protection products. We currently have a phage based active substance progressing through the EU approval system, which, if successful, will be the first in Europe and is one which would not have been possible without the financial support and associated collaborations made possible through Innovate UK support. Whilst it's perhaps too early to tell, we are optimistic that there is a bright future for bacteriophage preparations to become important tools for improving UK food security, although of course there may still be more challenges around the corner to overcome. So thank you very much for your attention today. If you have any questions at all or might be interested in working with our team, then please do get in touch. Definitely. Thanks to Alison for, for uh, providing that uh, presentation uh, in, in record, but certainly a, a great success story of how they, they pushed through and got a lot of confidence, confidence from the funders, confidence from regulators, confidence from, from food businesses. That's, that's, that's remarkable. Next, I'll welcome to the stage uh, George Eldridge to present uh, your presentation. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I hope you've all had a very insightful uh, first few talks of this uh, opening of the Leicester Phage Centre. Uh, so my name is George. Uh, I'm a third year PhD student working at now the Leicester Centre for Phage Research. It's going to take a lot of getting used to saying that and introducing myself instead of University of Leicester. Um, so I'm here today to talk about my work with APS Biocontrol, uh, looking at using bacteriophage to combat sophrot disease, specifically in the potato crop. So Ali did give a, a nice introduction to sulfur disease. Uh, so I normally kind of give a little pre-warning of my talks if they're done near a meal time, because I often will have lovely pictures of rotting vegetables and foods. Um, but you guys haven't quite had lunch yet, so you should be okay. Uh, so sulfur disease is primarily a bacterial disease of uh, vegetable and ornamental plants. It's spread through uh, farming equipment uh, and also the water you spray, uh, spray on the crop. Um, and the loss of yield due to this disease is primarily due to, or uh, occurs during the, both the growth, uh, transport and storage phases uh, of the crop growing process. So today, as Ali said, there is no commercially available treatment for soft rot disease. Uh, so farmers are re uh, solely reliant on sanitization and disinfection of their uh, equipment and anything they spray uh, upon their crop. So like I say, my research is primarily focused on potatoes, uh, and in that industry, in the UK alone, uh, soft rot disease causes approximately 50 million pounds worth of loss, and if you were to scale that up 
to uh, global scale, you're looking at sort of three quarters uh, of a billion pound uh, loss per annum. So my project aims for my PhD uh, were to primarily isolate and characterize uh, novel bacteriophage against soft rot causing uh, bacteria. Uh, so these are primarily pectobacteria and uh, decaya um, bacteria. The second part of this was to develop uh, an understanding of what we're deeming as bacteriophage cocktail dynamics. So as Andy mentioned, um, bacteriophage cocktails are similar to a cocktail that you'd have you know, in a bar. It has multiple uh, constituents of elements, so multiple phage that are able to target uh, different species of uh, bacteria. So by cocktail dynamics, I mean, so does the presence of these multiple phage within a cocktail uh, actually reduce or enhance the efficiency of the treatment? Um, so this wasn't an initial first uh, aim of my project. However, sort of initial results from the first year of my PhD uh, led us to this route where uh, you would infect with a single phage um, that technically didn't harm or didn't kill that bacteria. Um, however, you actually instigated a negative response from a bacteria that's not actually harmed by that uh, specific phage. So obviously we want to make sure that the phages we are putting into our cocktails don't cause this negative response. Uh, from bacteria that aren't actually infected. And so finally, I wanted to then test uh, the efficiency of any bacteriophage isolated and also any cocktails um, using a potato model, which I will describe later on. So the first stage of this was the actual phage hunting process. Uh, and bottom right is me enjoying myself wandering through the wilderness. Uh, that's actually just north of Leicester and Bradgate Park. Um, looking for environmental samples. So the successful environmental samples uh, for myself uh, were the likes of soil. So back home in Norfolk, so the top left image, um, there are lots of fields, as you can imagine, that grow potatoes. Uh, so I know a lot of farmers over there who I was able to get soil samples from. Uh, you've also got potato wash water, which is as it sounds, it's solely the water that we collected the water that people in the lab were washing their potatoes with before they were cooking them. And also uh, irrigation water. So the next step to the phage hunting process is to expose your uh, bacteria of interest to the sterilized environmental sample. Now, when I say sterilized environmental sample, this is solely to remove the bacterial fraction of that sample, so you're not getting any biased results towards that bacteria that was already in the sample. Um, but you will still retain your viral fraction, so the fraction that contains your, hopefully contains your bacteriophage. We then screen for the presence of these bacteriophage using something we call a plaque assay, which is what we have on the top right of the screen. So anywhere where you can't see through the agar plate, so you can't see sort of the black background, is where the bacteria has successfully grown. But in the areas where you've got this almost what we call a plaque, this sort of circular area of clearance, is where you have uh, a phage has caused lysis of a bacteria. Uh, and obviously that's a very uh, good plate that you'd hope to get from a uh, phage isolation screening. So the results of my PhD to date, so I've currently isolated 27 new bacteriophage. Um, they are relatively diverse, uh, so their genome sizes range from about 39,000 base pairs uh, all the way up to 150, 160,000 base pairs. Uh, and as you can see on the right-hand side, this phylogenetic tree, so the phages I've isolated kind of fall into three distinct groups. So you've got this kind of group at the bottom here and then two separate groups at the top. The phage I've isolated um, are varying in their complexity. So the slightly smaller phages, the sort of 40,000, 50,000 kb phages, um, only produce about 47 or so proteins, uh, whereas up to the higher end, you're looking at nearly sort of 270, 273, some upwards nearer 300 proteins. Uh, so there is a variety of complexity in these phages. Now, I put on here 86% coverage, so this was Initially, I was given 34 uh, strains of bacteria that APS um, were struggling to isolate phages against. Um, so of my 27 phage, I now have an 86% coverage rate. So there is still, I don't know why it keeps moving forward. Um, there's still uh, sort of 14% of that, that uh, of those bacterial strains that we can't find phage for that are still evading us, but I'm still trying. Um, and several of these phages are what we call broad, broad host strains. So uh, I can't remember if it's been mentioned, but when we say broad host range, it basically means that one phage does not infect a single uh, species and strain of bacteria. It can infect multiple. So in my case, one of my uh, phage is able to infect 67% of that initial 34 strains. So that was a very useful phage for uh, treatment of soft rot disease. 
and on these TEM images were taken at, uh, at the University of Leicester. Um, so one of the, so I think that is one of the smaller genome uh, phages on the bottom here. And then you've got, uh, I think that's the uh, 150 kb phage at the top. So just to kind of uh, illustrate this sort of varying complexity, so you've got the 40,000 base pair uh, phage only produces about 48 genes, most of which, uh, as per the kind of key, which hope comes across okay on here, uh, are to do with sort of structural genes, so that's making new uh, phage virions, um, but also DNA replication and maintenance and genome packaging. So very simple, the phage enters, it replicates itself, it produces more of itself, it lies as the host, and then goes on to infect uh, further bacteria. When you then move up to the slightly more complicated phase, so you're looking at 145,000 uh, base pair phage here, you've got 254 genes. Now, on top of all the standard genes that were present in the 40,000 base pair phage, you've also got things such as regulatory genes, tRNAs, and also super infection exclusion systems, which, for those of you who haven't heard, is essentially that um, the phage, uh, this phage, once it infects a host, it's unable to uh, be infected by a similar, uh, a similar phage. So it's quite a selfish phage. It wants to replicate itself and not allow other phage to uh, replicate alongside itself. You also have uh, restriction modification. So restriction modification is a way bacteria are able to circumvent phage infection, prevent phage infection. Uh, and this larger phage is able to modulate that um, to enable it to uh, evade this, uh, this uh, exclusion system. So like I mentioned, we then wanted to go on to testing these phage uh, in the potato. So the first step, we take the, the raw potato itself, we then slice it and sterilize it using a combination of bleach uh, and various ethanol washes. We then punch a hole in the center of the slice, um, which is a, of a certain size. We then inoculate that hole with, uh, I've put on here bacteria, but it could be, uh, like I've put at the bottom here, phage only or a mixture of phage and bacteria. And we then essentially, over a certain time period, we then take measurements of the rotting area uh, and that gives you an idea of how well the, uh, the phage or phage cocktail is working to uh, limit or even completely remove this uh, soft rotting effect. So just the last, quick last slide. So I've worked with uh, Ali up at APS for you know, three years now. Um, and it's, as part of the PhD, uh, it's really sort of enhanced my experience in terms of that initial stage. They were able to give me really good advice and give me the resources to really hit the ground running with my PhD. Um, you spend a lot of time, I think, if you, you know, when you're not working in the tree, sort of choosing your direction and choosing where to go. Uh, whereas APS really sort of maintained that focus for me and ensured that I didn't uh, lose time on potentially interesting, but also, um, you know, not strictly relevant side projects, uh, which by all means, I really wanted to go down some of those. Um, it also, I think it's also important to say it gives you perspective as well. So it's very easy in, sort of phage research to not realize where you're going and where your research is sort of being used in the wider, the wider community. So working with someone like APS, I can see where my work is going. It really, it really helps motivate me on those days where, you know, nothing's worked, days, weeks where nothing works sometimes. Um, and, you know, it really, it, like I say, it really keeps a good perspective. So, uh, yeah, I'd just like to thank uh, my DCP program, so Midlands Integrative Biosciences Training Partnership, Obviously, my two lovely supervisors, Martha and Ed, sat over there at the back, hiding away. Um, but also APS Biocontrol, uh, and also members of now MSB Lab 230 or the Leicester Center for Phage Research. Thank you. Thank you, George. George, not too far. You're going to take a seat there. I'm going to I'm going to welcome the rest of the panel to come and join us up front. Evelyn, Will, Kath, please. Evelyn, you might as well grab the mic because the first question is to you. Just a reminder, I've got uh, some questions I'm going to ask the panel and then we're going to hand it back over to the audience until we uh, hit uh, break time. Uh, but Evelyn, from, from your seats at, at Quadrum, uh, as we mentioned, a genomic expert in, bac in bacteriophage, not just bacteriophage, but virology. Uh, but what do you see as, as the strengths and opportunities uh, that would actually push phage-based technologies towards having a practical impact on, on food safety? 
Uh, thanks, thanks, Matt, and thanks for organizers for inviting me. Um, I think there's uh, there's definitely a lot of, of strengths and opportunities um, when it comes to phages in any food production and, and food safety uh, scheme. Um, first of all, I want to give a short caveat that um, when it comes to bacteriophage and applications, there's two important things, and one of them is the, um, the type of phage that you choose, um, you know, having the correct phage for, for your application, and then um, a good understanding of your production system or your food system to make sure that you have the correct place for the application. So if you have these two in place, which is not straightforward, um, then we can really come to the, the, the strengths of bacteriophage, bacteriophages in that they're um, natural, that they are cheap to produce in a way <laughs> at high quantities, um, but not necessarily easy to produce. Um, that they have a huge genomic diversity. So I'm not here today to talk about any genomics and taxonomy, but that's my side project. But because there's such a huge diversity, there's really a lot that we haven't uncovered yet because we've been using the same ways of isolating them for 100 years. Um, so there's a lot that we haven't uncovered yet. And I think one of the, one of the um, areas that we've become more cognizant of recently is that there is, everything has a microbiome. So food also has a microbiome and using bacteriophages to targetly knock out certain um, members of this microbiome that cause spoilage or um, cause issues later on, um, that, that leaves the possibility to leave this whole protective microbiome of the food intact, so be, you know, um, be more targeted um, and, and less collateral damage. And then when it comes to opportunities, I think um, one, of the, one of the things that I find fascinating, and I haven't done much research into this myself, um, is, is the fact that we can engineer phages to be more um, um, effective. Or, for example, to engineer their host range. There's fascinating wor work across the world by you know, inserting CRISPR-Cas systems into bacteriophages, modifying the, the receptors um, that they bind to bacteria to, to modify the host range. So I think that that's, that's definitely one of, the, one of the areas that, specifically in, in food chains, um, there's lots of areas of opportunity. I'll stop there. Excellent, thanks, Evelyn. Uh, let's go over to Will, please. Uh, so Will, from your seat at NBIC, I'm certain, certain that you've seen a lot of different technologies that are used to control microbes, whether it's from a spoilage perspective, whether it's from a, a, a food safety pathogen perspective. Uh, but wh what are your thoughts on, on, on phages? So how, how, are, how is this community gonna ensure a positive impact by using phage as, as, as a treatment on food for, from your perspective on biofilms? Sure, yeah. So. Um I think that the, the previous talk from AP Biocontrol kind of went through a lot of this in, in quite a lot of detail, but as a funder um, and on behalf kind of our industry members, what, what we tend to like to see is a very well-developed kind of USP about exactly the same unique selling point, what, why a phage is better than uh, current methods <coughs> or even the same as kind of new novel antimicrobials coming through. And I think we've spoken about the, the specificity and things like that, but the really the, the proof is in the pudding when it comes to phage and so what what i personally would really like to see is some really well thought out um proof of concept projects so this is something that you can get funding from you know so embic does this but also innovate uk as, as was mentioned in the ap bio control um presentation where you know a collaboration between someone who's already in the sector whether that be farmers or or a company producing phage and then a university or an existing network and kind of collaboration between those and kind of well-known names within the food sector, so people they know and people they trust. So, you know, when you're talking about things like the UK Agritech Centres, so, you know, uh, CIEL, uh, Agrimetrics, CHEP, and uh, the Agri-Epi Centres, and then people like Camden BRI, engaging with associations like Chill Food Association and others. So, you know, if you get, you know, even early stage data, if you're familiar with TRL levels, kind of two to four, where there's that big valley of death that people kind of in the innovation space call it, um, where you can take the product, you can demonstrate that it works, even if it's in one of the models that was spoken about earlier from the team at Leicester, or whether it's kind of some very kind of small scope kind of in, in vitro studies. You've proved it, it's involving people that they know, 
And then, you know, as, as um, the AP biocontrol meeting, once you've got that, you can then move on to larger scale investment from you know, people like MBIC or Innovate UK. You can get internal investment, you can get angel investment, you can actually move on from there. But we need to prove that it works with people that they know and they trust first. That's great, Will. So another comment that's you know essential to move this forward is, is confidence in, in the approach, and funders want to be part of that confidence building. That's great. Yeah. Um, let's go over to uh, Kath, please. Uh, we've seen this already in some of the presentations that collaboration between uh, industry and academic groups is, is, is probably essential to, to move things forward. How, how, how does that play from your own experience at Nottingham? Yeah, I mean, that's been absolutely fundamental to, what, to, the, to our development. So my involvement slightly different so we're using phage as a diagnostic so using that to track bacteria and to try to understand where pathogens are now when you're doing that and you're talking about that in the lab and you know we come up with these methodologies based on our understanding of phage moving that into an applied space really needs the understanding of the process so going out and sort of understanding I mean, in our case, it was in agriculture, we were looking at bovine TB and understanding how animals move through the farm even, so that understanding you know, which animals should target for diagnostics. Uh, you, know, you can come up with the best test in the world if it can't be applied as it needs to be because of the industry needs it's not ever going to be a commercial product. And that also goes as far as regulation. It was a bit of a shock as an academic to have invented something that I thought was the best thing ever because I could now detect bovine TB in blood and be told by the regulators, but that doesn't fit with policy or law. <laughs> and then you're like, oh, right, okay. So it is really important to understand that regulatory framework and to have that as part of the commercial development. It's not just about good scientific ideas. It's not about proof of principle. It's the whole market. And that collaboration, I've learned so, so much you know, from a, you know, an academic who was relatively naive going into those industry spheres has made, you know, it's opened my eyes to what really needs to be done in terms of translational science. And it's it's and the other half of the equation, it's very, very important. Thanks, Kath. Uh, George, you kind of chuckled there when Kath mentioned the, the, the perfect product, and you mentioned your, your, bacteria, your beautiful bacteriophage. Uh, what was your own experience trying to put together a little bit of evidence in front of a regulator to, to keep this product moving? So I think it was, it was difficult. So obviously, when I picked up these, uh, these initial uh, strains of bacteria from uh, Ali over at APS, Obviously, I then had this 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 thing this thing in the back of my head where I'm, you know this big company has struggled to find bacteriophage for these uh, for these bacteria. Um, so you know how on earth am I going to um, find them myself? But I think it's it's important that now and this comes a lot sort of along uh, the lines of Andy's stuff with the genomic analysis and looking at close relatives of phage. That I think it's important that we also consider the techniques in which we use to isolate phages and how. We've got these. We've got these techniques that, as it's been mentioned, have been used for decades on how to isolate phage. That you expose to your bacteria, your sample or environmental sample, or whatever, to your bacteria of interest, um, and you know you then do a simple plaque assay. If there are no phage plaques there, you haven't got phage. You start again. I think it's important in certain scenarios where it's important to look at the closest relatives, start looking at your closest relatives from a genomics point of view. Um, and as Evelyn mentioned about you can engineer phages, there is also work where you can um, sort of uh, fast forward evolution of phages. So looking at the closest relative and potentially looking at finding phages for that closest relative and seeing what elements of that closest relative you can use to kind of force the phage in that particular species to push towards the species of interest you uh, are looking at targeting because if, if you're really struggling to find these phages, it could be potentially that there aren't, well, there will be some, but whether they are easy to find in the environment you're looking at uh, is you know, very difficult. But. Excellent, thank you, panel. So now we're gonna open it up to questions from the room. Um, I'm not sure if we have an extra mic or we'll do this uh, daytime TV style and I come to you. Um, but let's, let's start here. Thanks so much, uh, my name is Ben Buckle, I'm head of regulatory affairs for a small uh, British Swiss startup called Mutral. Um, I have a long background in animal health and drug development in regulatory affairs, both in Europe and the US. Um, and I have some familiarity with licensing phage-based technologies in the US. Um, 
consumers, of course, expect the food that we produce, be it animals or, or crop, to be safe. I'm a toxicologist by training. We can discuss what that means. Um, but that is a, you know, one of the table stakes in, in the food production process. My question, uh, perhaps, to the panel is, is, is this. Of all the stakeholders that are involved in producing food, be it the farmer or um, you know, the, the slaughter, uh, slaughterhouse or the processor, who pays for these phage-based technologies? That is a very, very pertinent question. Um, so in terms of the sort of veterinary market, I mean, that has been the big question. Who pays for the development and then who underwrites the cost? So it's a very complicated question. It, and it, I think it varies if you're looking at something that is involved that is a, affecting production or if you're actually looking at food safety. So the farmers are interested in systems and tests that will help them improve efficiency and stop wastage. And of course, the regulators are interested in products that are safe, or the, or the retailers even are safe to market. So it does, you know, there's a gap there that it makes it difficult to who you, you target. I mean, we've had some success going to trade bodies, which are then groups of interested uh, producers who will pay a levy into a body, and then they have then said they will look at supporting the types of technology because it is, for an individual company to take it on, often they'll be talking to, uh, to you about sort of having exclusive license. Well, of course, as far as the investors in your company are concerned, selling it to only one person for the next 10 years is not going to work either. So there's a commercial balance there, and it is difficult, but maybe the trade bodies and taking a broader uh, aspect on this would be the you know a, a better model to get it funded. Yep. Um, I think um, uh, it's it's a complicated question. I think a lot of it will depend on the application um, and the the you know the critical control point in whatever um, production system you have. If if the you know if that lies in in the the supermarket supply chain, then um, that might be, you know, th there might be a different type of co-funding um, than than if it's in, at the farmer of or at this, uh, the side, you know, in the consumer's house for food safety. So I think um, uh, one of the the areas that we definitely need to go forward, um, especially with, with something like this, what we're doing now is, is identifying key, you know, um, academic and industrial partnership that where the, the fundamental research, like what George is doing, the fundamental research goes, uh, happens at the university side. Um, and then the partnership creates the, 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 the IP and the, the application. Hi, I'm Tim Hammonds. I'm the Royal Society Entrepreneur in Residence here at Leicester University. I spent many years working in early drug discovery, and actually my question relates to safety as well. So there are two layers of safety here. One is public health safety, i.e. when you eat this product, are you going to be safe? There's nothing going to happen to you. But, but um, Andy talked about gene transfer. The talk about um, the regulators being very worried about gene transfer and, and swapping of genes between organisms. How early in the process can you build in tests to see whether the phage you're choosing are actually doing that? Because if you can rule them out early, I think you give confidence to the regulators on the way through that that isn't going to happen and you're not going to have the headlines of the Daily Mail that you're creating a, a superbug. Yeah, I think that um, you can do that very early on in, in your you know, laboratory process to um, develop some key, there's phenotypic and there's kind of genomic based tests that you can do to identify, um, you know, uh, how easily a, a phage mobilizes other um, DNA. Um, George Salmon, George Salmon's lab in Cambridge used to do a lot of that work and uh, that's kind of, uh, that's actually um, kind of, Short funny anecdote, the, the phage that I found for my PhD, which was also for potato tuber soft rot, was found to be a very um, efficient um, uh, mobilizer, so we had to kind of stop that specific phage. 
Um, and that's where kind of the genomics work that we're doing and that what Andy is doing and Thomas is doing and all of these uh, comes in is now that we've identified that this, these group of phages are very efficient at mobilizing other DNA, um, we can now say that, okay, if whoever isolates one of these type of phages, we already know that they're highly likely to also do that. And then we actually need to make some sort of kind of more like risk database for these groups of phages that we say, okay, this group, warning sign, we, are, we don't go further into developing that one because it, it will likely mobilize it. In a sort of phase four clinical trial, as I would call it in drug discovery, when you, if you actually got a phage to market, is there a test you can do on produce that says, have we done something here where actually we've created a bacteria that we, we don't want to create? Or we, we, is it, because again, that shows confidence to the regulator that you can monitor post-launch. Shall I, or do you want to take or? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the joy of working with bacteria is that you can do an awful lot of tests in a very short time. So if you wanted to ask that question and to, to ask if, whether you get new combinations of genes in, a, new, in a, a population after phage therapy, that's perfectly possible. So yes, I mean, th those sorts of tests can be followed. But again, it's very easy. I mean, we've talked about the genetic route, but actually showing that you've got transduction or mobilization of genes is very routinely simple. And we can, we can event, you can detect events, one in a million, one in even you know, 10 to 6, 28, you know, really rare events because the way we do bacterial work in the lab we can actually push the limits to that it's not like having fields full of cows where you can't do 10 million very easily but you know so the joy of working with bacteria is we can ask those questions um and but i think everyone who works in phage biology is also very aware of that that's you know it's kind of first on the list of is it going to cause a problem so it's not something that we're naively ignoring Go to the side of the room, and then we'll go to the uh, back of the room, please. Thanks. Uh, this is a question from one of our online delegates. Um, can you comment on the bottleneck around manufacturing facilities uh, that handle phage scale-up, and how much, would a how much of a hindrance would this be, and what can we do? Any panelists willing to tackle the, the production question, the bioprocess question? Um, manufacturing is definitely an issue in the UK. Um, we don't have the type of GMP facilities that are necessary to prefer to um, to create um, high um, highly controlled batches of phages. That's specifically an issue for I'm going to say human applications. So I don't want to get into that here. What I see as an opportunity in the in the in the food production systems is that we can we can get. Um, still high quality non-GMP phage um, delivered here. Um, it's, um, I don't think there's, there's not many people specialized in this uh, and there's definitely kind of, if anybody wants to create a startup to kind of get into this space, I think there really is a space for this. Um, so get going. George, George, do you know for APS Biosystem, do they have, I'm presuming it's not GMP, but they have some sort of maybe a certificate of analysis that's satisfying regulators? Do you know what level of accreditation they have in their process? So I don't, personally, I do not know. Um, assuming if Ali was here, she would know. And that's the sort of question that uh, if people have, they can pose to, uh, pose to Ali and APS. Um, but I think I was just going to just go a bit off topic back to the uh, this gentleman's question about how... Um, in sort of the regulatory side of things to the public's mentality of um, administering essentially a virus into their own body obviously is a very big hurdle, especially with, you know, people know what's gone on the last sort of three years. But I think it's important to know that, especially in sort of my work where the majority of my phage were found in potato wash water, a good 80% of those. So had that phage not been washed off the potato, the, hu the customer would have been eaten. And, you know, we've been eating potatoes for, you know, a significant period of time um, and as far as we we're aware there are no sort of harmful health effects I think that's quite an important uh, well yeah so yeah but sorry yes yeah yeah, um, yeah. Kath has a comment 
yeah, I mean, it's a good point, Matthew. You're saying different levels of certification or, or, or qualification. It is all GMP. So as far as producing it for a phage therapy, biocontrol, or for a diagnostic tool, it's all got to be produced under GMP, so you've got that control. The level of purity and the level of purification you require may be different for different applications. But you're still going to have to have plants who can deliver that as this sector grows. And there is a l real limitation in the UK of people who can deliver that for us. Um, I was recently talking to a group in Finland who wanted to do phage therapy, and they were talking about sending their products potentially to Poland, because that's the only place they could get them made. And so it's not just UK, it's Europe, there is a limitation on this. Well, sure, if I just briefly. Um, so I've come across similar things before in terms of a, a lack of capital investment in a certain area around manufacturing of novel antimicrobials. Um, I think well, there's a couple of ways of doing it, but the, the one that we tend to like is kind of going back to the, the proof of concept studies. If you can show a body of evidence from food, from animals, and from humans to say that there is a large amount of R&D going on, there's this many businesses with this amount of turnover even just doing the stuff that they're able to do now, and do a joint industry program where they all put in a certain amount, and then you can go to the funders themselves with, through one of the large capital investment bits. That's one of the easier, and none of it is easy, but one of the easier ways of doing it um, for a UK-wide organization that could potentially create the, uh, the phages to whichever stand standard of GMP you want for human, animal, or, or food. But yes, that, that's not going to be a, a quick fix or an easy one. But Thanks, Will. You know, it's an important question when all four panelists weigh in. So let's go for... Tracy. Hi. Uh, my name is Tracy Nevitt. I'm, I, I'm head of discovery at the same company that Ben is at. Um, so akin to the question from the front, but a little bit different. So most phages till now have had more of a chronic application, not chronic, uh, an acute application. Going forward, especially in agriculture, in animal health, where there is a more sustained um, application, how do you monitor? And, and I appreciate that there are readouts or applications where the readout is evident, such as an infection, but more subtle readouts that you're trying with, with regards to productivity or whatnot. How do you know that your phage cocktail has stopped working? So, first of all, very good question. Um, in response to, obviously, how, in terms of a longevity study, um, so, from my point of view, whenever I isolate phage, I will always test them on the bacteria and re continuously expose it to that bacteria for, um, so, some of my work, I've looked at 72 plus hours um, to see whether you get any sort of resistance buildup from the, from the bacteria, which, you do, in some bacteria strains, you inevitably will get resistance build up. In others, you don't see that resistance build up so much. Um, but I think it's important, like I said in my presentation, how you need to understand how these phages, even if they're not for your target bacteria, potentially will interact and cause, potentially cause issues. So part of, my, part of my work with APS is looking at taking resistant bacteria that have developed to these uh, phages and first of all, seeing are they more aggressive in the crop? Do they actually cause rotting systems, uh, rotting symptoms, sorry, uh, to develop faster? Um, but also, are they still vulnerable to an additional phage um, that we have in the collection so that you can almost do similar to a similar concept to how you do sort of crop rotation in the field, sort of do a phage mix rotation to kind of try and minimize this resistance development? Um, that amplify the possibi possibility of a, a resistance mutation. So it's not longevity in itself, but just the opportunity by just the application on sheer billions of animals at the same time, or throughout time. I'll, I'll briefly, briefly say and then pass it on to the other side is um, if, 
this this will require continuous monitoring. So this will just be continuously re-isolating the, the the potential pathogens. Let's say you use a, your your phage in a prophylactic way, so you can't really say you know whether something's going on because you don't necessarily know the incidence of your pathogen. So continuously re-isolating the pathogen and retesting it on on your product, and then you know we have the possibility to having you know multiple phages that can be can be more used in a in a mix and match way if if your pathogen changes your cocktail will change um, this is one of the things that can be done but it will require some more close monitoring than just you know having a broad spectrum antibiotic for example yeah interestingly uh, uh, one of my colleagues at Nottingham has been working with um, looking at treatment of chickens with compilobacter uh, um, to control compilobacter using phage that's an interesting phenomenon that these viruses have to have a receptor on the surface and quite often those receptors are essential features of the cell. So what we were finding with the, the, the Compilobacter project was when you took the cells that became resistant from the chickens after post-treatment, they were less infectious. So there is a viral driver to identify, well, no, no don't, it's not, don't put an, a, a human aspect on this. There is a natural selection process that goes on that if you're a virus, you tend to evolve to target something that the cell needs. Because if the cell can lose it, you can't infect. So that evolutionary pressure exists in quite a lot of cases that the, that the structures that the viruses are targeting give the, the cells fitness. And then if they become resistant to that because there's mutations in those, then they become, the bacteria become less fit in their other role. So it's, it's for us, fortunate, but you know, the ultimate is... Yeah. Yeah. Do you know the other regulatory nightmare is to prove that every phage in your, your, your uh, sample is identical? Because as a biologist, I know they're not. You know, so... Yeah, we <laughs> so but that is what we're asked to do. And it's about education, and we have to change the knowledge base of the regulators to accept the fact that this is a biological entity. And I say parallels have been drawn with the sort of work that's going on with um, the sort of uh, fecal transplants, because those populations you put back in are never identical either. But we have to create a framework that allows the use because we can see that there's, that, you know, there's benefit. So post-market surveillance, another card from the uh, antibiotic playbook uh, that's going to be relevant here. Will, did you have something to add? Or? No. Okay. Well, we're, we're at time. Um, the, the panel, we had actually, inspired by Eurovision, we had prepared a song as well. We were going to do a <laughs> rendition of Finland's Cha Cha Cha, but <laughs> given, given we're out of time, we're just going to move on to the refreshment break. Uh, now that you know the panel better, you know, during the, during the networking and refreshment break and then lunch, have, have a conversation with them. Uh, so we're, we're due to come back at uh, quarter after. Um, we are almost standing room only, so, so maybe do leave something on, on your chair. Uh, but, but certainly if no one's, if, if you're not in it, if, if the chair is empty, make sure it's, it's uh, noted for someone so they can come grab it from you. Um, otherwise, I think the refreshments are, are downstairs, friend. Yeah, so downstairs and then back up for, for quarter after, and we'll get back in with the, uh, the animal health uh, panel. Thank you. This is going to focus on phage usage in animals. And our first presenter is uh, Raj from Karas. So the stage is yours. Thank you. So what I'm going to try and do is, is give you a flavor of how we're involved in the phage world. Um, but as, as a starter, perhaps, it's good to give you an indication of who Karas Animal Health is. We're a fairly young company, started in 2017, funded by 
uh, a Japanese company, Kiretsu Siaku. Uh, and we have interest in both diagnostics as well as in terms of therapy and animal health products. Uh, and all of it pretty much ties in with the concept of One Health, where there is that direct axis between man uh, and beast uh, and animals and the environment. So there is that core value that sort of permeates through the, the thinking of what we do. And one of the areas, of course, that is of big interest to us is antimicrobials and dealing with the issue of uh, antimicrobial resistance. And this is where the interest in, in uh, viruses of microbes comes in. And looking at, uh, historically, the, the veterinary sector has been a big consumer of, of antibiotics. And when you start talking of antibiotics in terms of hundreds of tons, thousands of tons, it is a substantial amount of material that's going into the environment. Um, and there's been a concerted effort, both by governments, uh, as well as regulators, and also the, the veterinary uh, uh, profession to try and bring that down. And since 2015, there's been a really concerted effort globally to reduce antibiotic consumption, and it's been working really well. In the UK, it's, gone, it's been reduced by almost a half, from 400 to about 200 tons. Um, but globally, there has been this, this drive to try and reduce uh, antibiotic use. But they're still needed, and there's still a ch set of challenges facing uh, the industry uh, in terms of managing this, this problem of antibiotic resistance uh, and the consumption of antibiotics. <clears throat> and that's down to the intensiveness of farming. Um, there's a limit to what's available as an alternative. Um, big strides have been made in terms of animal husbandry, uh, improving the environment of the animals in which uh, they're kept. Um, and of course, the big regions, the EU, the USA, UK, and even China. China used to have a consumption of around 69,000 tons in 2015, and it's gone down to 30,000 tons. Really big reductions. So all are making concerted efforts, but it's still quite big. and still, still an issue, and there's still a way to go. And building alternatives is, is, is one of the key areas uh, where effort needs to be made. And there are a lot of alternatives, and phages happens to be one of them. Now, we've already heard a lot about phages and how good they are at doing certain things. They're hunters. They're very specific at what they do. Uh, so you can target your, your, your pathogen directly. Um, antibiotic resistance isn't an issue for, for phages. They have their own issues with resistance, which is a different matter. Uh, they're very versatile. You can use them in human health, veterinary health, uh, hygiene, uh, and they should be sustainable. There, there is a limitless supply, pretty much, of phages out there. It's a case of finding the right ones and using the right ones to target uh, the problems that we have. A big issue uh, for, for, for phage work and for industry in trying to get phage products through is regulation. And for the veterinary sector, we have a number of channels we, could, we, we, we can go down. Therapeutic is the obvious one, where the pathways, although not entirely clear, one understands what the roadmap roughly looks like. Uh, in the EU and the UK, you have zoo technical. This is pretty much for uh, feeds, uh, breeding, uh, feed additives. Uh, these are regulated, and they're regulated by the EU uh, and the UK. <clears throat> by the uh, food standards agencies. In the US, there's something comparable, uh, but they don't use the zoo technical term. And finally, there's biocides. Of course, phages are killing things, and they're biocides. So I'll try and give you a flavor of what we do uh, and how they sort of fit in with that sort of landscape uh, and some of the interesting approaches we're trying to take in moving forwards in this, in this sector. So, We've got a couple of products that I'll talk about which are companion animal, uh, one which is to do with aquaculture, and a third one which is more uh, uh, ruminants. So pyoderma, well, the first one, is, is, is a disease of the skin on dogs. 
in this particular case. Uh, and it's a complication of atopic dermatitis, or eczema, if you like, for dogs. It's quite common, 1.3% uh, in the UK and EU. Uh, and it's, the key thing here is that Staphylococcus uh, pseudotomedius is the causative bug in 80 to 90% of cases. So it's, it's fantastic because it's one bug which dominates uh, this disease. And so it's, you think, well, that's got to be a good target for phage work because you're not having a, a really complex mix of bacteria to deal with. It's just one. Uh, the prevalence of multidrug resistance is growing and it varies. In the UK, we're pretty good. It's about 5%. But in places like Japan, 70%. So it, it is a growing problem, and it does vary according to geography. And bacteriophages would be a good candidate for this sort of product. Now, obviously, the, the frequency is very high. You can't do personalized medicine uh, as a service with this type of product. Um, first of all, the, the, in terms of cost tolerance, cost tolerance in, in the veterinary sector is, is way lower than it is in, in, in human medicine. Um, and also, the numbers are, are just too big. So we sort of have taken a, uh, an ambitious view on this. Uh, that we would try and develop a, a pharmaceutical using phages. Now, the work we've done here is, is that I'm going to show you about the part the, the, the pyodama work has been led by Dr. Emma Bell. Um, <clears throat> and what we've done is isolated a, a, a large library of phages from various sources uh, from animal samples, from environmental samples, and so on. And these bacteria have been, uh, bacteriophages have been screened against a panel of uh, isolates from disease dogs, as well as isolates from normal skin. And we've found a very interesting difference in the way that these phages are behaving uh, in those populations. Uh, most interestingly, that uh, the, the isolates from healthy skin seem to be resistant to the phages, very resistant to the phages. And <clears throat> it's, it's very visually pretty clear from our panel that uh, uh, the, the normal healthy isolates aren't particularly susceptible to the phages. And most of them tend to have very few prophages. In fact, I think it's only one prophage that all of those isolates have, and some have none. Whereas the, the, the ones that are affected by, uh, well, the ones from the, uh, the disease sites tend to have multiple infective uh, phages uh, and are susceptible. So at first we're thinking, this is great because if they're disease causing, they'll be susceptible and they'll be hit by the phages. And if they're resistant, they won't cause disease. But the reality is a bit more mixed. It turns out that actually uh, the ones that are causing disease are actually a phylogenetically distinct population uh, that are different from the rest of uh, the pseudointermediate strains. But that's going to be a useful thing in terms of screening, in terms of isolating more targeted phages, um, and uh, being able to, to, to deliver something which is more useful as, as a therapeutic. So if we're going to develop this as a, as a pharmaceutical, there are obvious things that we need to be able to do. It's got to have a stable formulation. It's got to have low residue level for, for a product that's going to be put all over a dog. Uh, it's got to be easy to apply. The phages have to be stable in whatever we put in uh, that, that formulation. Um, it's going to have things like detergents, other excipients to keep, give it stability, uh, antibacterials. Um, it's going to have a long shelf life. And ideally, of course, it's going to have a, a stable temperature stability, at, sorry, a stability at, uh, at room temperature or ambient temperature rather than needing uh, cold chain transport and storage. So the work that, uh, that we've done with fixed phage, fixed phage have a technology for immobilizing phages. It turns out that this really helps with stabilizing the phages in, in, in complex environments. And we've utilized that uh, in this project and others that I'm going to discuss in helping stabilize the phages that we work with. And this is just an illustration where phages which have been fixed on a, on a pharmaceutical ex excipient have been put into a commercially available gel, which has got all the different ingredients that you normally have in a typical uh, pharmaceutical preparation. And you can see that clearly 
in the right circumstances, you can create stability. And this is a key, key requirement if we're going to produce a pharmaceutical. <clears throat> this clearly requires a lot more work. We're still working on this, but we have very promising results. Also, the fixed phages appear to be more effective in an in vitro skin model where the, the uh, staff is actually put onto a, an in vitro skin model and tested against free phages versus fixed phages. For, for some reason, the fixed phages seem to be more effective, even though in terms of titers, you've got equivalent titers of phages in both situations. So there is something going on there that needs to be teased out, uh, and the work on that uh, is in progress. So for this, <coughs> the next steps are really to try and, and use it in the clinic. Um, so we're applying phages under Cascade. Cascade is a, a process uh, available to veterinarians where if there is a, a registered product for that disease, you have to use that. If, it's, if there isn't one, you can use something which isn't uh, indicated for that disease. If there isn't anything like that, you can then use something which is uh, not uh, regulated, but only under uh, ethical approval. We'll establish a master file, which gives us a, a wide range of phages to work from. Uh, we'll formulate cocktails of a small number of phages, which can do the work in dealing with these uh, pathogens. Have rotating cocktails, as we discussed uh, in the earlier session, so that you can overcome the problems of uh, resistance from the bacteria. And of course, we have to do the, the trials. And the trials um, would be classic clinical trials with GMP product. And for that, we are developing um, manufacturing capacity and capability with a manufacturer, Jafral, or Jafral, uh, who have expertise in uh, manufacturing phages. The second product is very different. It's not one which you would go down the therapeutic route. It's actually a hygiene product. It's, it's, it's a very different thing. It's for helping keep dog's teeth reasonably clean and healthy. Um, so it's a very different uh, direction compared to the previous one. So dogs do have really bad uh, teeth. How many people here have dogs? And how many of you would buy chews and dental sticks regularly? Oh, you're wonderful. <laughs> and how many of you would brush your dog's teeth? Oh, <laughs> this is clearly a very, very uh, good, good audience. Yes. So you are very, very exceptional because most people tend, not to, <laughs> tend to do neither of those. And so you end up with really manky teeth. Um, inflamed gums, and the problem is worse for, for pugs and dogs which have, or brachycephalic dogs which have squished faces. They have real problems with uh, their, their teeth. Um, and of course, with, with bad teeth goes bad breath, um, and <clears throat> it turns out that Porphyrmonas goulet is the keystone bacterium in biofilm formation. So in other words, it, it has a pivotal role in, in uh, forming those biofilms uh, and maintaining them. And, and also, once, once things get bad, they have a big role to play in actual uh, periodontitis and dental decay. So the aim is to develop phages against this particular uh, bacterium, which is not one that phages have been isolated from before. But we've gone through that. Um, and this work was... Uh, led by Gordon Smith. And we, so we've got a, a panel of bacteriophages against this, this, this bug, and we've shown them that they're very good at killing uh, this, this bug in vitro and, and also in complex biofilms. Uh, and again, we've used the fixed phase technology to try and stabilize them to see how that works, whether we can stabilize them. Uh, and also um, to ensure that we can, we can target this product to as wide a, a geographical area as possible. We screen against P. Gullius strains from as, as far as, as wide as we can. <coughs> one, of the, 
one of the key things we found with some of these phages uh, is that they are able to, uh, to, to disrupt biofilms. And this, this biofilm work was done in collaboration with uh, Glasgow Dental School. Uh, and Gordon and his team were able to put together a 10 species biofilm where the layers are put in in the right order. Um, and P, P. Goulet was, was, was one of the components. But when you put in the phages, you, get, you reduce the uh, biofilm size very quickly uh, in a very short time. And the proportional decrease is, is much greater than the population of P. Gouli in that, in that biofilm, suggesting that you're actually destroying the biofilm. Um, and so various enzymes produced in that infection is actually destroying the biofilm. And this is just to illustrate how you could put the phages stably onto dental chews, onto a paste, uh, as you require. Uh, and and this, this just simply shows some bits of chicken jerky which have been fixed with phages. And you can see that the, uh, the porphyrmonas is that horrible green stuff. And you can see the halo of lysed porphyrmonas where the phages have carried out an infection. And again, in terms of stability, um, fixing them appears to give them a good deal of stability. And this work was done with an earlier protocol of fixing. The guys at Fixed Phage have developed uh, newer iterations of, of fixing, which are more effective and more efficient. And we anticipate that that picture would look even better. So that, that the third project that I'll talk about is very different again, is aquaculture. So this is production animal. The area that we focused on is recirculating agricultural systems. Now these are essentially closed systems where there is no external water coming in, everything is circulated within. There's, there's small amounts of water to replace wastage, but otherwise it's very water efficient. Um, and there is a big drive in this area to develop large RAS systems. Now, most RAS systems, there are a lot at the moment, but most of them tend to be to take egg to fry. And after that, they sort of go outside. But here, we look, we're talking about going from egg to finished fish, in this case, salmon. So this, this, this particular system is Atlantic Sapphire in Florida. And they are looking to produce 300,000 tons of salmon a year in that enclosed system. And that the fish are raised entirely within that system. Now, there are advantages of that, but there are also disadvantages in that uh, if, if, if something goes wrong, it's catastrophic, particularly if it's infection or it's a technical problem. Uh, last month, they lost 400 tons of fish because of a technical issue that uh, caused a problem for, for, for their systems. So in terms of dealing with pathogens, you have a limited number of possibilities. You can't use antibacterials in the way that you may otherwise because these require biofilms to, to sustain them. And the biofilms are important in nitrifying the waste products and you, you, you don't want to disrupt them too much. So phages are potentially very useful in this setting. And we're working with uh, Professor um, Matthias Middlebow in Copenhagen on a particular disease in salmonids, flavored bacterium sarcophyllum. And this affects uh, the, the small fish, so from egg to when they're about 50 grams or about 15 centimeters. And for, for that range, you can't really vaccinate them. And again, when you have an infection, it's catastrophic. You lose whatever's in that tank. Uh, <clears throat> the bug itself is, is an opportunistic pathogen. In other words, it doesn't always cause disease. This is when uh, the circumstances are right that disease happens. And when it does happen, it's quite catastrophic. And they survive very, very well in aquaculture systems. They hide in, in nooks and crannies, in pipe work, so they're very difficult to get rid of. So if you think of a, a typical system, you've got the big fish tank, with thousands of liters of water. So chucking phages into that is a bit of a challenge. You have mechanical filters to get rid of solid rubbish. You have the primary biofilter that does the cleaning. This is a microbiome. 
uh, which, which does a, a huge job and needs to be kept intact. And what we're proposing is putting in interchangeable phage biofilters. So use the technology we have to immobilize phages onto plastics and things, incorporate it into a biofilter so that all the water eventually goes through that biofilter. If there is planktonic bacteria uh, in sufficient numbers, they'll get infected. And that infection will then spread and kill off other bacteria in, in the tank. So it's a way of controlling and preventing disease rather than treating. And the guys at Fixed Phage have done this work and shown that they can immobilize phages onto the biofilter materials uh, and quite stably. So it's, it seems to be going in the right, right direction. So we're lucky that uh, Mateus has been collecting phages for about 10 years. So he's got 120 plus phages. Now, they're very interesting phages, and what he's found is that all the phages he's collected tend to attack a very particular uh, secretory mechanism in, in flavor bacterium. And when they attack that, they disable it. And when it's disabled, these bacteria become non-pathogenic. And he's been able to show that in challenge studies in fish. So they don't, they don't infect. So if we're in a position where we can treat these, these tanks with the right phages, it'll kill the susceptible bacteria. And the resistant ones, they're fine. They're not causing disease. So it maintains a healthy environment. And this work has been, uh, we've just got a grant recently, uh, this last month, for 2.8 2 million uh, euro equivalent from the uh, Innovation Denmark Fund, uh, the Innovation sister, UK Sister Fund. <clears throat> so this work is now going to progress and we'll be testing some of these uh, ideas in experimental tanks and eventually into uh, fish tanks. The last one I'll, I'll, I want to talk about is, is really to do with greenhouse gas emission. And we're all familiar with the importance of uh, mitigating CO2 and methane. And we know that uh, cattle produce a large amount of methane as well as goats and sheep. Um, and there is, there is a need for finding ways of, of dealing with this. And uh, there is at least one company represented here who is working in this very, very area. <laughs> and there, there's a need for, for multiple solutions in this area. And where we think um, this may be possible is, is by looking at microbial viruses of archaea. <clears throat> Not bacteria, but a different domain. And one particular uh, species is, is dominant in, in producing the methane. And so we, what we've been doing with uh, Professor Clokey's lab uh, and with Jamie Newbold, professor at uh, SIUC, he's a, a specialist in the rumen microbiome and fixed phage, is looking at uh, the viruses of archaea. And this is a project we've just, just recently started. And the work that, uh, that I'm showing is, is, was done by Dr. Sarah Rashid, who's over there. Um, so she's managed to isolate viruses to, to archaea, which is, a, which is a fantastic thing in itself. Um, these viruses have been shown to be active uh, in vitro, so they can reduce methane production from the archaea, um, and they seem to have the sort of trace that we're looking for. So we, the, the, the aim here is to try and develop a library of archaea that we can take into the testing in uh, an in vitro model of the rumen, and then ultimately uh, in the rumen itself, in the animal. And then the key thing is, well, how do you deliver these, these viruses? Uh, if you stabilize them and fix them, you could deliver them in a number of different ways, either in feed, in uh, licks, or in a bolus. Boluses are things which are routinely used in um, animal farming. They contain minerals and, and supplements which add to the animal's diet, and they stay there for the life of the animal. Earlier on, I showed you this slide of, of the different regulatory 
uh, pathways. And this, if, if you map what we've, we're doing to the possible regulatory pathways, for pyoderma, it's pretty straightforward. It's a medicine. It's going to have a pretty clear direction. For oral health, it's not so straightforward. In the EU, it's a zootechnical biocide. In the UK, because it's deemed a, a borderline um, medicine, or borderline active, it's a medicine. In the US, it's generally regarded as safe. For production animals, the recirculating um, aquaculture system product, well, that's different because it's not treating the animal. Uh, is, is, is it really being a biocide? Is it sort of maintaining a particular phenotype in a bug? In Denmark, it comes under water conditioning, uh, but under EU law, it's a biocide. Uh, in the US, it goes under the pesticides, grass regulations. In the UK, we don't know. Uh, for methane mitigation, UK is a borderline, therefore it would be medicine. In the EU, it would be zootechnical. In the US, it would be grass. So clearly there are uh, a lot of complications when it comes to dealing with products that you want to develop if they involve phages. Not least because of the regulatory hurdles. In terms of the, the, the scientific and the technical space, all of those things are manageable. Um, as was uh, mentioned in the, in the previous session, a lot of the stuff you can do before you even got to the animal. You can test for um, toxin genes, you can, you can test for uh, their ability to, to disseminate uh, genetic material. You can do all of that stuff before you've even got to the animal. The key thing here is us having this dialogue and being able to educate one another. The regulators have a hard job. That job is, 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 is an important job in, in maintaining the security and health of the animals or people. Uh, we've got to understand exactly what their requirements are. And with that dialogue, I'm pretty certain that we can find a pathway for all of those challenges. And the challenges, the big challenges, are the regulatory ones, as far as I can see. Thank you. So we will take questions uh, at the panel. So next up we have Anisha, who was, here we go, who has more experience of doing um, phage trials in animals than anyone else, I think. So. Thank you, Andy. Thanks, Andy. So the, I'll be talking to you today about one of the, the projects that I've been working on. So I'm currently a postdoc at the Leicester Center of Phage Research. And one project I've been working on is how can we use phages to reduce salmonella in the poultry food chain? So the pathogen we've been working on for over, about, over about six years now, I would say, is salmonella, as it's the leading cause of food poisoning worldwide. And it causes approximately 96 million infections uh, across the world. And I found this really nice figure here, which highlights all the common vectors that cause infections in humans, and um, which are seafood, poultry, pork, and beef. And, and you can see it's a common issue worldwide. And it, this figure also, also shows the common subgroups of salmonella that cause in, in infection in these livestock and fish and in humans as well. And the most common subgroups are um, typhimorium and in pteridus. So from these vectors, poultry and pork are the biggest um, vectors that transmit um, salmonella to humans by their consumption of contaminated food. And in both these vectors, salmonella can live in the gut of the animal. And um, once the birds and poultry, are, the birds and the pigs are slaughtered, that, that's how salmonella will get into the, the human food chain. In, in pigs, salmonella does cause a nasty infection, which causes um, diarrhea and a loss in per performance of the pigs. So they gain less weight, they eat less. So overall, their performance is affected. In chickens, the infection can be asymptomatic, so it does go missed often. But once the birds are infected with salmonella, they will shed it 
through throughout their lifespan. And of course, this, po this poses a huge um, food safety risk. And as the global um, meat production is exponentially increasing, there, um, there has been predictions made that there'll be more and more outbreaks linked to salmonella. So we need to find ways to reduce these outbreaks. And what is very concerning as well is that salmonella is becoming multi-drug res resistant. And we are seeing re reports like this all across the world. So this report here was published by the Euro European Food Standard Agency in the EU, which highlighted that over 41% of strains they isolated from pigs and broiler birds were multi-drug resistant strains. And these, these strains are getting into our into the human food chain. So we need to find a way to limit their spread in the food chain and, and to find alternative treatments to treat these infections in pigs and chickens. So the, the project we have been working on is to de develop a phage product against those prominent salmonella strains associated with chickens and pigs. Although we have been focusing on, on both, the focus of the talk will, will be on the chicken side of the work. So whenever we start a phage project or design a, a phage product, a common um, pipeline that we typically use is first that we isolate the phages against those dominant strains. That then we characterize the phages to identify what they kill. And then we go on to test efficacy of the phages and make sure they do kill their um, targets. And this is a common pipeline we use for all um, phage products in, in the lab. So when we started this project, we received funding from AHDB Pork, who are a pig levy board in, in the UK. And with their help, we were able to collect um, fecal samples from all across the UK, from boar, pig, um, chicken fecal samples and sewage samples. And from these samples, we isolated 21 phages, as we typically find phage where the bacteria nat nat naturally lives and salmonella is commonly isolated from fecal samples. And from these samples, we isolated these 21 phages and it, it's just a few pictures of what they look like. And then we characterize these phages and we, um, and we found that our phages are really broad. They, they can kill over 250 multi-drug resistant salmonella strains from all the top groups of um, subgroups that are associated with infection in pigs and chickens. And all of these multi-drug resistant strains that we tested were all isolated by the Animal and Plant Health Agency in the UK. So they are a good re representation of the circulating strains, especially within the UK. And then we sequenced the phages and we tested their stability as well. So Andy has already shown you that, that we, we have some um, that we have so genetically similar phages, but but they are um, incredibly heat stable. So so we have been working on um, formulating these phages to make stable pr products. And lastly, we have been looking at designing and testing efficacy of our phages. So what we found um, is that when you combine phages as cocktails, their killing improves. And we've we've um, we've assessed their activity in various lab-based models that, that we have developed. And we've designed a phage cocktail, a two-phage cocktail, that we found to be the most effective at killing. So I love showing this image in talk because it's a nice visual representation of how effective phage therapy is. So this is the larvae infection model. And in this model study, what we have done is infected larvae with salmonella. And after, two after 72 hours, they all die. And if you look at the top image here, all the larvae turn black after, after 72 hours, so, the, so they have all died. But if you treat them um, with a different phage cocktail combination, over 80% of them survive. And again, that, that two-phage cocktail I mentioned in the pre previous slide was the, the best at um, improving su survivability of infected larvae. After we, we collected all, all um, this brilliant um, characterization um, data, we have been working with AB Agri, who are a, um, a feed company, 
um, to conduct poultry trials to, and to test the efficacy of this two-phase cocktail that we have developed. And we've conducted three trials together where we have been looking at if we can add phage to feed, water, and then just give it in water on the last week of the study. And in all three trials, we've also been looking at different doses of the phage cocktail as well. So it's a relatively new field, so no one really knows what the optimum phage cocktail dose is. So this is the reason why we've incorporated um, three doses into our work. And in all trial data I'll be showing you in the next, next few slides, chickens were challenged with salmonella on day four of the study. And over the course of the study, we collected fecal samples from each pen to monitor salmonella in the phage counts. So the, in each trial, the trial setup was we had six groups. So the first group was um, the no salmonella challenge group and no phage. The second group was no salmonella, but phage at the middle dose. So this was our phage control group. The third group were birds that were challenged with salmonella, but no phage. So that, that was our, ne our negative group. And then we had groups four, five, and six that were all challenged with salmonella and were given an in, in, increasing dose of the, the phage co cocktail. So in each of these groups, there were 16 pens with 11 birds per pen. So it's a very large scale study. So in each group, there were about um, over 150 birds. So in total, we were using um, approximately 1,000 birds in the trial. So we, we did collect a, a huge amount of data. And this is to show you what the room setup looked like and what the um, pens look like. So the, when I mean a pen, I mean um, a half of that. That's what I mean by a pen. But, and all the groups were, were um, located in different rooms to reduce any cross-contamination between salmonella and phage. So in the first study that we did, we delivered phages in feed. And this was just liquid phage. There was no in, in, encapsulation or anything like that. It was just liquid phage that I had made in the lab. And this figure here shows you the number of pens from which we isolated salmonella. So on the x axis, on, on the y axis, you have the number of pens, and across the x axis, you have the, the day in which the samples were co co collected. And in red, in the red bars here are the negative control book groups. So these are birds that were just challenged with salmonella. And in the blue, green, and orange bars are all the phage treated groups. Uh, what we found uh, on the first sampling point day, which was just four days after the birds were challenged, we were finding salmonella from fewer number of pens. And we saw this trend till the end of the study on day 42, where we actually found the lowest dose of phage cocktail was the most effective, and we didn't isolate any salmonella from any pens. And in the middle dose and the highest phage dose that we tested, we were isolating salmonella from about three or two pens, but the average salmonella counts were significantly less. So this data beautifully shows that phage treatment was effective at reducing um, salmonella in challenge birds. In the next study, we um, de delivered phage in water instead to see if, th if this could be a, um, a viable delivery route. And again, um, this figure shows you the number of pens from which salmonella was isolated. And what we found was that actually water treatment was much faster acting. So it seems to be a better route to um, de de deliver phage. And even just four days after birds were challenged on the first sampling point at day eight, we were only isolating salmonella from less than six pens in, in comparison to the negative control where we isolated salmonella from 12 pens. And we saw this trend to the end of the study and this trial was a bit shorter in comparison to the feed one, but at day 35, we didn't isolate any salmonella from, from any pen from groups given the lowest and the highest phage dose. And from the middle dose, we, we only isolated salmonella from one pen. So again, this could be an effective route. And lastly, we looked at phages de delivered in water, but only given um, on the last week. So before phage treatment began on day 28, we were isolating salmonella from all challenge groups. 
But after phase treatment began on day 28, and on the last sampling day, day 35, all three phase do doses were effective at, re at reducing salmonella. So we didn't isolate any salmonella from any number of pens. So in this instant, all three doses were effective. So it, again, it beautifully shows how effective phage therapy is. So when you compare all three trials that we've done so far, what we've found is that water treatment seems to be the best in comparison, but we've also found that all three doses that we tested seem to be effective at, re at reducing salmonella colonization. And one thing I've not touched on is that what we actually found is that phage treatment improved the, per the performance of birds as well. So birds that were phage treated, they actually gained more weight in comparison to birds that, that were just challenged with salmonella. So you see, so aside from reducing salmonella, phages seem to have helped to improve the performance of birds as well. So for farmers, that could be more money long term as well. And as another endpoint, we looked at Sika as well. So we collected Sika samples in these trials. So Sika is an organ of the chicken that, that commonly gets heavily colonized with salmonella and we use this as an endpoint assessment and, the, and at the end of the trial we collected um, seeker from two birds per pen and this table here shows you the average salmonella counts that we found from the seeker samples and on the y-axis you have the salmonella counts and on the x-axis you have the different delivery routes and what we found in all three de delivery routes, that all three phage doses that we tested, we didn't isolate any salmonella from any of the Seeker samples. So phage treatment was effective at reducing um, internal colonization of salmonella. One thing that has been touched on is that um, changes in pH can impact phage stability. And Within the chicken gut, the pH can get as low as 1.6 or 2.5, shown here in, in, um, in the red box. And phages, especially our salmonella phages, don't seem to be stable after um, below pH of 3. And one thing that we did was to, to monitor pH stability was to um, look at the phages that we re-isolated from the fecal samples. And actually, we found the case that phages are actually stable and they aren't being in inactivated by the changes in, in pH as they transition through the chicken gut. And we were re-isolating salmonella from, from the fecal samples. So what we found is just, um, what we also found was that there was active phage replication as well. So between day eight and 14 was when we actually saw peaks in um, salmonella colonization, and that's where we actually re recorded the, the, um, the highest um, phage counts as well. So phages were actively replicating. And as, as and how has been touched on before, the main barriers we are facing right now are production and regulation. So with our industry partners, we have collected um, fantastic and convincing efficacy data to show our phages do work and they do help to reduce salmonella colonization. But the current barriers are that we can't produce our product to scale. Um, there are technologies available, like Adam is showing downstairs, to produce phages to 50 litres. So it could be possible to, pre to produce it to this scale, make a concentrated product and then di dilute it down. But of course, it, it is not, this may not be a practical application because for the poultry and pig mar mar market, we would need tons of phage. So we are hoping with, um, with Fran's innovation network, um, phage network, we'll be able to solve this issue. And another barrier is regulation. We're really not sure how phages will be reg regulated because there are two streams that they could be reg regulated as. So they could be regulated as a feed additive or as a veterinary medicinal product and each and for each route the route to market is completely different so we don't quite know what data where we're meant to collect to um, for the regulators to assess our products so but we have been talking to regulators across the UK who have been incredibly helpful and they are working to help um, clar clar clarify the route to market 
And recently, there was a document published by the, Euro by the European Medicines a Agency where they um, specify what kind of quality, what kind of safety studies and efficacy, efficacy studies we should be doing um, for phages and their use as veterinary medicine. So what would be really helpful is if we had a similar document published in the UK. <laughs> so just to summarize, we've isolated a, a panel of um, 21 phages that can kill multi-drug res re resistant salmonella strains. We've tested if our phage cocktail works and we've delivered it by feed or water. And we've, and we've shown that by both routes, both routes are effective at reducing salmonella in challenged pigs. And we've shown that phage treatment does help to improve weight gain of challenged birds too. And the success of our, of our project has only been possible through the collaborative research we have been doing with a AHDB Pork and AB Agri. You have the expertise to help coordinate our re research because we, we were unclear of the market size, if a product like this could do well, but with their help, we have been able to um, really plan our research. And, uh, of course, it's been touched on production and regulation are, are the limiting factors right now. And we have just submitted a BBSRC to look at both of these aspects, and we should hear back in October time. So fing fingers crossed for that. And importantly, I just want to thank our, one, our wonderful funders, HDB, HDB Pork, and the Ma Mandy is here t t today as well, and AB Agri and Nell is here as well. Um, for their continued support and their, f and their funding. And, la and most importantly, I want to thank my superstar supervisor, Martha, as well, for um, always believing, me, believing in me and giving me this fantastic opportunity to talk to you about some of the work I've been do doing as well. So thank you very much. Thank you, Nish. So we all have questions at the panel. So um, we have an addition to the schedule. So we have a flash mob talk uh, for five minutes. That's what I've Thank been told. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'll try and get through as quickly as possible. Um, hello, everyone. Um, so my name is Rakesh Thacker, um, and I'm a director and head of regulation at, at Unimed Global, uh, a human pharmaceutical wholesaler based in the UK. And over the pandemic, um, a bit of an existential flex, and I moved into animal health. Um, so I founded Vets for You, and we are an online retailer specialising in animal pharmaceuticals and, and as a pet dispensary. We believe in fairer prices and helping animals, and that's, that's really why I'm here today. I am that regulatory guy. I'm the one that makes SOPs and is always talking about quality. I'm not a scientist, I'm an economist, and I'm here today to talk to you very briefly about One Health and perspective. Firstly, we'll take perspective. I am a British East African Indian who was born in Leicester. My family home is about 10 minutes that direction. Um, and my second language is Chinese. I inherently see the world with a different perspective, as I'm sure all of us do here, and today is about talking about those different perspectives. I am also a wildlife photographer. And every day I wake up thinking about how to help animals. Um, a few months ago, I was in the Falkland Islands, and like today, I'm just riding the wave. Leicester is home, and and it's very special to me, so it's very special to have you all here today, so thank you and welcome. Um, in terms of perspective, I travelled out to the Falkland Islands for the 40th anniversary of the Falklands War, and I got to go to Steeple Jason, and I saw the largest albatross colony in the world. These are black-browed albatross, um, and there's almost 250,000 pairs of albatross out there, and our rockhopper penguins as well. Now, when we talk about perspective as a photographer, it is great because we lead and we change people's perspective. So this is the same place a few hours later. The power of perspective. The strength of this city lies within its great institutions and the people that are here. From the heroics of Leicester City to the greatest rugby team in the history of rugby, the Leicester Tigers. The Tigers were named after the 17th on foot, the local regiment to Leicester. 
They were named the Hindustan Tigers, the Royal Hindustan Tigers. And we can learn a lot from these institutions, like the academic institutions here in Leicester and the University of Leicester. Down the road, we have the prime example of how humans and animals and nature can work together. We have the Royal Army Veterinary Corps. In the army, they say no plan survives first contact and nature always runs its course. In the RAVC, just down the road, every horse and every animal that you saw in the coronation and every dog that protects and serves us all come from here, just down the road in Leicester. Their work is incredible, but working with the environment takes patience, it takes time, and as the Chinese would say, we have to understand the flow of the river and not work against it. But when you get it right, the symbiotic relationships that are formed and the, the positive multipliers that work when we work with nature are so important and they go far beyond all of our expectations. The University of Leicester was founded as a living memorial to those that passed in the Great Wars. This great university has stood only for 100 years, yet as this city, it punches well above its weight. The university not only finds history, as it did with the, the king underneath my school car park, it also makes history, as across the road from the Phage Center shows the impact that the discovery of DNA had goes well beyond everything that, anything that could have been imagined. I love penguins, and penguins, like humans, love to run. Now, when we look at what's good in the world, and these penguins are actually heading off to get the food that they need and the food that they want, we often run straight towards what we want. And, and if we actually look up here, there is actually a predator. And there's a southern sea lion that is, that is hunting these penguins. And it's something always to be aware of. When we find something right and something good, like we did with antibiotics, how can we learn from the lessons? And how can we learn from what we've, what we've seen with AMR? How can we consider temperance, moderation? How can we integrate stewardship into our thinking and, and engineer that into what we're doing now here today? How can we make fair stewardship from a One Health international perspective? How can we share the lessons learned from the human healthcare and the incredible standards that we have for human healthcare and how can we transfer that to the animal clinical settings? Currently there are gaping holes in animal surveillance, even here in developed economies. So we should be creating a national prescribing software so we know more about what's going on in the animal kingdoms. And the post-market surveillance and the discussions this morning, these things need to be there for phages to have the impact that we all know that we needed to have. Post-market surveillance and prescribing software will allow more species-specific levers to combat the threats of AMR and also allow us to have the impact that we need for novel therapies such as phages. The Lancet report in 2019 shows a significant concern for sub-Saharan Africa in particular, but all developing nations and economies. I am proud of the regulatory work that this country does, particularly through the MHRA and the VMD, and, and everyone that's in this room that's working towards the, getting the science done properly at the beginning. The VMD itself, through their international office, with the Safer Medicines for Animal Regulatory Training, SMART, um, and, and the FAO's UK reference office being here in the UK, gives us a unique opportunity to actually make an impact, not just here, but for the world. How can we make sure that the science that we're doing today is translated into something tangible and effective in Africa, in Asia, and in the developing world? If we have an essential medicines list for humans, why can't we have them for animals? We need to set the environment for phages. Can we lead a Commonwealth pooled procurement system underpinned by British science and the work here in the University of Leicester? I'm trying to will some of these things into existence, but we have to try. 
I believe in what you guys are doing, and it's so great to see all the people that I see in the labs in, un, under Martha here, and, and to see them all out of the lab coats and talking to everyone, it's, it's brilliant to see it here. Um, and sometimes it's just about those people taking the leap. So if not us, then who? And if not now, then when? Thank you. Thank you, Rack. Uh, if you'd like to take a seat at the front, so if I can just ask the panelists uh, to come forward and s sit at the front. I think I need an extra seat. So we are running uh, slightly over, so it'll be slightly abbreviated. Uh, the food at Leicester is very good, but it'll probably taste better when everyone's starving. Um, so we're going to run 10 minutes over the planned scheduled finish time before you all go to lunch. So if I can just start with, uh, uh, can the panellists that haven't spoken, could they introduce themselves and their experience with um, bacteriophages? Neville. I'm a vet by training and I work at AHDB and I head up the animal health and welfare team there and we um, sponsored Anisha's initial work I think on, on the pigs and, and salmonella. I do not really work in phages but I'm really interested in the talks today about collaboration. We are a statutory levy board and we collect a levy from every kilo of pork that's produced, every pint of milk that's produced and every kilo of lamb and beef and we reinvest that into trying to um, provide the industry with the mechanisms to provide food for the UK and beyond. Thank you. Uh, so if we could start with Mandy and Helen. If, uh, what opportunities do you Sorry, that was the time for the talk. What opportunities um, do you see in this space for using bacteriophages um, in animal health? I'll start with the microphone. Um, a huge number of opportunities, and I think the talks today have outlined some of those, uh, those quite clearly. Uh, like the speakers have said, I think we need to be very um, careful in, in the outset about how we go about that. And Anisha talked about the, the massive industries of pig and poultry and the number of kilos of, of material that's going to be needed. But I think by working collaboratively, so for example, we've shown that salmonella in pigs tracks very clearly down the breeding pyramids. So you start with a, a very small population of pigs at the top of the pyramid. If we could control salmonella in those, we probably wouldn't need the massive number, uh, massive volume of phages that you're talking about. So I think working collaboratively, absolutely, and um, very keen to do so. But a huge number from diagnostics to therapeutics, food safety, animal health, yes, but equally, I don't believe it's a silver bullet. So let's make it part of the toolbox, not the only tool we've got in the box. Um. <clears throat> yes, and I, and I wrote some notes because there's a lot, lots of useful answers being given, and I don't want to repeat what's been said already because I agree with a lot of the comments that were made by, by colleagues earlier. I think it's really worth reiterating that um, use within animals, so provided by feed or by water, really is in two categories, and this was said by somebody earlier, but there's the food hygiene aspect and there's the animal health aspect, and I think it's really important to differentiate between those two things um, for several reasons. Um, it defines the regulatory pathway, which I think has been covered several times already, um, but it also, I think one thing that it hasn't, we haven't covered already, is it defines the um, route to market and therefore the operational structure that's required for organisations maybe such as mine. So the channel that you would send a food hygiene product um, versus um, an animal medicine, for example, is quite different. So your customer would be different. Even within an integrated animal production model, your customer would be very different. So what you need to sell that, your sales teams, your um, supply chains all need to be different. So 
I see those two categories as being really important, um, but we, we have to really make sure we understand the differences between the, those two and the implications that that has for development. Thank you. Um, if we uh, can start with uh, Raj for this, is there any particular research or uh, activity that you could think of within um, that would be required to progress um, in the field of, of using phages and animal health? Is there a, one specific item that's missing? I don't think there's any one particular item I could, I could put my finger on. A lot of it is about um, marrying up what's required by regulators and working backwards almost. A lot of it's about giving confidence to regulators that what we're doing actually works and that it is safe. It's a perfectly simple statement, but um, there's a lot of history of doubt that ties in with phage. Uh, the idea that there is a risk for toxin gene transfer uh, the risk of other things happening. It's a living organism. Once it gets out there, it can do its own thing. All of those things play on the mind of regulators, and quite rightly, and we have to persuade them that what we are doing is fundamentally safe, and that we're taking the right safeguards uh, to make that happen. And the work that you do in terms of understanding what the, 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 the viral world looks like is... is the core of it, because we have to be able to say what we're doing is perfectly safe based on what's out there already. Thank you. Uh, the, anyone else on the panel that would like to add to that? Have to. Thanks. I, th I think one of the things that I've learned through my time in the veterinary field is that unless you engage with the end user right at the start and understand the barriers that they have to use of these products, you're not going to succeed. And I would advocate and would be very willing to help anybody who wants to make contact with the farming industry because we've heard how farming has caused antibiotic resistance and yet in the UK we've actually reduced antibiotics by, by so much and the pig sector alone since 2016 has reduced antibiotic use by over 70%. We are actually quite responsible, and now in the UK, the, the latest figures from Rumour, which is the responsible use of medicines in agriculture, show that livestock in the UK only account for 25% use of antibiotics in the UK. So it, it's, it's gone right down um, from, from where it was. We've been very responsible. I think if we want to engage with the farmers, we have to start working with them and that kind of positive behavior, saying, you know, you've done a good job, we want to work with you. We're not perfect, I'm, I'm not saying we are at all, but working with us and, and giving those positive messages that they are responsible users of antibiotics rather than you're the bad guys is going to go a long way to developing collaborations. And at the end of the day, we're the, they're the ones that are going to need to, to use these products, so right from the early stages. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, uh, so in the interest of time, I'll open up the floor to questions. Uh, Joe at the back. Hi, um, so I'm Joanne Santini from UCL. Shall I stand up? So speak to you. No one, have, you don't have to turn around, sorry. <laughs> um, so just a question about, um, so I totally understand the use of phages to, to kill pathogens or opportunistic pathogens. But I'm a bit concerned of the use of phages to kill commensals, such as methanogens, which are an important part of the um, microbiome of the rumen. Of rum, of the rumen. So um, have you thought about the impact on your cows? No, certainly, I think it's, it's a very important point that you make. And I think you can't get rid of all the methanogens. It's about identifying which methanogens tend to be associated with methane production a large amount of the methane production. There tends to be a bit of variation in terms of uh, the, the, the rumen microbiome as to how much methane is produced. And that variation is, is affected by two, two things. One is the genome of the cow itself, and the other is the environment it's in. And you can get cattle, which live very happily, have a much lower methane output, uh, and have a very, very good, healthy uh, conversion of feed. So. 
I, I take your point. I think it's an important thing to, to demonstrate that when you do interfere with something, that you're not interfering to the detriment of the animal. Uh, do we have any other questions from the floor? Is that because everyone wants lunch or they're a little bit shocked? Yep, of course. Thanks very much. I, I think that's a, a very, very important question. And again, we've used antibiotics, anthelmintics, as kind of silver bullets to solve problems. We can't use phages to solve the methane problem. We need to look at the animal production as a whole and use it as part of the solution rather than just going down that route. Somebody earlier today talked about prophylactic use with, with phages. And for me, having worked in anti-anthelmintics and antibiotics, that's just something that we need to be really careful about advocating. And it comes back to your point about um, responsible use and um, stewardship. And right at this early stage of phages, we should be thinking about how we're going to use them in the future and making sure that we are using them responsibly and not just ad lib. So, yeah. I think I'd just like to add to that as well. I think the post-market surveillance bit mentioned earlier, I think we really need to look at how, not just in this country, but in all countries, we, we have responsible prescribing systems. So we know that the data that we're, we're getting is, is correct and we know trends are changing and what di direction they're changing. So I do think it's important and I think it does set the scene properly for phages or any other novel therapy that can help in this area. Thank you. Any other questions from the floor? If not, I'll thank uh, the speakers uh, for fantastic presentations and the panellists uh, for taking part and we won't keep you from your lunch any longer. Um, that's downstairs, out the doors and turn right into the canteen. Yep. And the next session will start in an hour's time. Thank you.
to everyone for our last session of the day. My name's Melissa Haynes. I'm one of the NHR's academic clinical lecturers, and I'm also a member of the Leicester Centre for Phage Research. And I come at it from a clinical perspective and as also a registrar on infectious disease and medical microbiology. So our final session is about phages in human health. And we are going to kick off with our first lecture, which is from Dr. Josh Jones. It's not going to be here in person, but we're going to watch the presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to start by saying how delighted I am to be here, both as part of the Phage Innovation Network Showcase and uh, the launch of the Leicester Phage Centre. So thank you very much for having me. Uh, my name is Josh. I'm the UK's first NHS clinical phage specialist, and I'm based in NHS Tayside. I'm also director of the non-profit company UK Phage Therapy. This afternoon, I'm going to introduce you to clinical phage therapy and hopefully get you really excited about the transformational impact this will have on medicine. I don't think we'll have time for questions at the end, but please feel free to send any by the email address on the final slide. So this afternoon, we'll look at what is phage therapy, what's the evidence around safety and efficacy, and what's happening here and elsewhere. And we'll finish by a look uh, at the uh, exciting future of uh, clinical phage therapy in the UK. So phage therapy has a really interesting history. Phages were first used for therapy in 1919 in a Parisian child, Robert Kay, who had bacterial dysentery and was treated with the filtered stools of another convalescent patient. And this really heralded the golden era of phage therapy, uh, which was used widely and enthusiastically in the West during the 20s and 30s. This, for example, was a headline in 1925 in the New York Times. But the use of phages declined partly because of a lack of understanding of what phages were, but also because antibiotics came along and these were easier to make and market and also easier to use because at the time you didn't need to test the sensitivity of a patient's bacteria to antibiotics, whereas you do with phages because phages are so specific about the bacteria they kill. Meanwhile, in Russia and Eastern Europe, they used and continue to use uh, phages successfully in military and civilian applications. Um, for example, you can buy phage preparations over the counter in Russia and Georgia. And today, antimicrobial resistance and perhaps a better appreciation of antibiotic tolerance has driven renewed military and civilian interest in the West and globally. So let's look briefly at how phage therapy works. This is just to illustrate that a collection or library of phages can be used in two ways, either to create empirical off-the-shelf cocktails, or a patient's bacteria can be screened against the phage library and a personalized cocktail prepared. Clinically, simple suspensions of phages are really useful as they can be administered in a wide variety of ways. And it's likely that this is where therapeutic phage use will, will focus, at least initially. So phase therapy has some attractive and unique advantages. First, and perhaps most obviously, it offers uh, killing of bacteria independent of antibiotic resistance with no notable side effects. Because phages are not pathogens, this means they're also suitable therapeutics for patients with immunodeficiencies. And the specificity of phages means they're considered to have minimal impact on commensal flora. Phages also have this curious feature of auto-dosing, in which uh, the remaining phages are destroyed by the immune system or excreted. Uh, and the dose of phages is effectively regulated by phage replication. The more hosts there are, the more phage replication. And once all those hosts are killed, uh, then there are no hosts left and, and those phages are uh, lost uh, to the immune system or excreted. Phages also have antibiofilm activity and there is in vitro and clinical evidence of phage antibiotic synergy. Uh, and phages perhaps can even resensitize bacteria to antibiotics uh, and the use of a phage might make uh, a bacteria more susceptible because we're applying two selection pressures and therefore as the bacteria attempts to uh, evolve to avoid the phage it perhaps renders itself more susceptible to the antibiotic. Relative to antibiotics phages are also uh, fast and, and, and cost effective to produce uh, and there is the, the potential here for personalized medicine because of the wide diversity of phages. I've just included some useful references on the right here. The paper at the top has a, a particularly good general discussion of the advantages and caveats of phage therapy. Moving on to the caveats. So first and foremost, you need to have a lytic phage that infects your bacteria of interest, and that's not always straightforward. Um, in polymicrobial infections, phages are also needed against all the pathogenic species to uh, achieve clinical resolution of infection. Now, phages generally have a, a narrow host range, and that's perhaps a bit of a barrier, but the way around that is to use cocktails of phages. 
And again, bacteria can and, and do become resistant to phages, sometimes rapidly. Uh, and the way around that, again, is either to use cocktails of phages uh, or to switch the phage or phages that are being used for therapy. Similarly, um, um, phages ca can be uh, the subject of immune responses. And again, switching the phages that are being used uh, is one way of, of mitigating this. Uh, phages can also be trained uh, by uh, in vitro directed evolution to be less immunogenic. So from a practical perspective, we've also got a, a limited access at the moment to repeated courses of phages. And while phages might be able to solve an, a, an episode of infection, they certainly can't resolve any underlying predisposition to infection. Um, and, and lastly, perhaps uh, crucially, the phages need to come into contact with the bacteria. And this presents challenges for intracellular bacteria uh, and bacteria that might be uh, in sequestered environments, for example, uh, in, in uh, epithelial layers in, in urinary tract infections. So let's look briefly at the evidence for safety and efficacy of phage therapy. So there is a substantial body of clinical data, much of which comes from the around two and a half thousand patients treated since the year 2000. And these are patients that come from a wide uh, a range of infection types and were patients whose infections were generally refractory to antibiotic therapy. I've just included here some um, efficacy rates from systematic reviews. Uh, and the caveats here are, of course, that this is observational uh, clinical data. And so treatment failures might be underreported. But it is reassuring that multiple different contexts and groups get very similar outcomes. Uh, and, and that is uh, consistently reported in the literature. It's also worth pointing out that the data that we can see probably underestimate, underestimates the true global size of phage data. Remember that East versus West split from the history of phage therapy. There's an awful lot that we can't access um, here in the West. And I just wanted to highlight then that there's this really important systematic review from uh, last year. Um, and this is uh, a systematic review of over 2000 uh, cases since the year 2000, which uh, found very promising efficacy uh, rates in terms of clinical improvement and bacterial eradication. And when this review looked at clinical trials that they'd included, uh, there were also more adverse events among the control patients than the phage patients. So on the point of clinical trials, it's worth noting that there have been 13 safety or, or clinical trials of phages since the year 2000 uh, by a variety of routes of administration. Reassuringly, all of these have shown phages to be safe, but efficacy signals have been mixed. Only two of the seven trials that looked at both safety and efficacy have actually shown evidence of efficacy. So there is this glaring discrepancy between a substantial body of clinical case data and seven clinical trials um, that have shown perhaps a mixed efficacy picture. And this can be explained because phages simply aren't straightforward to use. You need to get the right phage or phages to the right place at the right time to treat bacterial infections containing sufficient bacterial cells. If we get one bit of this constellation wrong, then, then we won't see efficacy. And the bottom line is that uh, largely by the author's own admission, five of these seven trials have missed one or more of these elements. But the two actually that show efficacy got this right. And you can read more about this uh, uh, in depth in this paper up here. So last year, the American Antibiotic Resistance Leadership Group published considerations for the use of phage therapy. And this suggested that phages might be considered for antibiotic refractory infections and that phages were generally safe with adverse effects rarely reported. And their conclusion was effectively that there is sufficient evidence to uh, consider phages in antibiotic refractory cases. Uh, you might be interested to know that Health Improvement Scotland uh, have also reviewed the value of phage therapy for antibiotic refractory infections and come to a similar conclusion. So let's just take a look at the, the global perspective. It's worth just highlighting that, that we are not alone in our interest in phage therapy here. There are a growing number of places worldwide. Um, for example, here I've, I've listed just a few from uh, Europe, uh, the US and elsewhere. Um, phage use is generally remaining sporadic um, and um, for antibiotic refractory cases, uh, unless we consider the, the Eastern Bloc. So we've been slow to get going on phage therapy in the UK, largely because of a lack of our own phage manufacturing. So currently all UK cases rely on imported phages. Um, phages produced in the UK need to be manufactured to GMP. And that's actually a good thing because although it is a, a, a barrier at the moment, um, GMP provides a recognized standard of quality, uh, which ensures that we get the best product to our patients uh, and it provides an exportable product. 
The other thing that's held phage therapy back in the UK is a misconception that existing medicines regulations don't cater for phages because phages are so different from chemotherapeutics. Uh, in the UK, phages can be considered for use as an unlicensed medicine in cases where licensed alternatives, i.e. antibiotics, are not meeting a patient's clinical needs, and that's covered by MHRA guidance note 14 uh, and local unlicensed medicines policies. So far in the UK, we've had two patients uh, who have received lengthy courses of antimycobacterial phages at Great Ormond Street, uh, and 10 diabetic foot infection patients have received antistaphylococcal phages here in Scotland. I oversaw this Scottish initiative, which began uh, almost simultaneously with COVID, unfortunately. Um, and with a brief survey, there seems to be an ample clinical demand for phages, um, uh, not just across Scotland, but, but elsewhere as well. Um, we now have a, a clinical phage lab being piloted in NHS Tayside during 2023, and that's what I'm leading. Uh, and we also have UK phage therapy, which is able to advise clinical teams elsewhere. So I think at this point, it's worth reiterating that it is possible to use phage therapy in the UK today, and there are no regulatory barriers to appropriate use now. That said, there are challenges, and the current setup of ad hoc phage importations is not sustainable. Uh, and I would really uh, commend this paper to you here for a, a more in-depth discussion of some of the challenges that, that uh, are presenting phage therapy in the UK at the moment. So let's uh, now look at uh, how we move forward from here. And I'd just like to signpost you to, to this paper um, for a more in-depth discussion uh, of the next few slides. So here we are today uh, on the left of this diagram, which comes from that paper I, I just uh, cited. Uh, and please do look at that for a more in-depth discussion of it. But here we are today on the left with limited ad hoc uh, unlicensed use of phages. Really the key barrier to progressing from here is uh, the access to GMP phages and that's what UK phage therapy is uh, doing with a range of partners um, and access to GMP phages is the only way really to create an equitable sustainable and high quality phage therapy provision that delivers for patients uh, in future. Moving on to, to what the future might look like uh, in some ways, it's important that we conceptualize phages as a new antibiotic. And the long-term vision is that licensed phage cocktails uh, would cover most clinical needs. And these would be used by all NHS microbiology departments, just like antibiotics are now. So we really want a, a distributed um, phage expertise across the NHS. Patients then who have infections that aren't covered by these licensed cocktails would then be referred for personalized phage therapy through UK phage therapy as a, a, a single national specialist service. So I hope that's given you a flavor of the exciting and transformative potential of clinical phage therapy in the UK. Thank you very much for listening uh, and please do feel free to get in touch with any questions. end of our first talk and then our second talk is from another member of the Leicester Centre for Phage Research Spiridon and Hi. This... How do I go to my presentation? Hi everyone, can you hear me? Um, so uh, today I'll be discussing about uh, how we can use phages to manipulate the microbiome uh, and basically the, what we know about uh, this research is as vague as the term manipulate the microbiome. And I will spend the rest of the 15 minutes to try to uh, build a framework uh, where we can possibly uh, use to uh, dig in into uh, this uh, type of technology. So why do we care about uh, the lung and chronic lung diseases? Uh, that's easy, uh, numbers don't lie. Uh, chronic lung diseases are the third leading cause of death uh, after cardiovascular diseases and uh, cancers. Uh, and in 2017, about half a billion people worldwide uh, had a chronic lung disease. Uh, things in, uh, in the UK are the same, really high death rate. Uh, it is the first leading cause of death uh, in children. And of course, they will have these uh, socioeconomic factors uh, that lead to uh, lung-related deaths being seven times higher in the poorest parts of the country. 
Um, at the same time, we have high levels of uh, misdiagnosis and underdiagnosis. Uh, and as a result of all this, we have low cost effectiveness. So the LANC uh, is, uh, performs one major task, as you all know, and this is to exchange uh, oxygen for uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, and during this, uh, this function, you know, what happens is that you have this uh, constant aerobic environment inside the lung, which is uh, excellent basically for many different uh, microbes and viruses uh, to grow there and replicate. Uh, and collectively, we, we call them the microbiome. So the past uh, 15 years, I think there's been a steep increase uh, in studies uh, looking at the uh, association between the lung microbiome and uh, COPD, asthma, interstitial lung disease, and of course, uh, cystic fibrosis. So what we know from these, uh, from these studies, basically, is that there's a, in some patients, the microbiome is really well associated uh, with uh, the presence of the disease, the development of the disease in time, but also the severity and the activity of, uh, of the disease. Now, the, the lung inside has uh, this very thin mucus layer, and this layer basically acts in order to trap the microbes and uh, the viruses. But in people with a more severe disease, for example, with severe case of COPD, uh, the mucus uh, becomes more thick uh, and it changes in composition. And as a result, we have these islands uh, of microbes and viruses that can stay there and create these uh, microbial communities, which are basically small ecosystems. Now, within these communities, uh, we have uh, all the different bacteria and the different viruses, and some of them will like each other, so they will collaborate, and th they will increase the probability of finding them in the same lung, uh, whereas others, we know, we're just going to be competitors, so it's going to be really hard to find them and observe them in the same uh, patient. Now, what is really interesting is that my, these microbes can migrate from uh, you know, these different islands uh, along the, uh, the lung. This is something we call local dispersion. So inside our lung, basically, this is an ecosystem. There's a lot of movement and a lot of functions uh, from the microbes and the viruses that are present there, including the phages. So when we're talking about using phage therapy to target the microbiome, essentially we want to target the system. And in order to target the system, we need to uh, understand some really basic properties uh, of the system, so the lung. So one major uh, thing that we need to understand is how these microbes get inside the lung. So we care about the replenishment of the lung uh, to, from microbes and, uh, and viruses. And obviously, the big stock is the environment. So the microbes and the viruses, you know, they flow from the environment, it's the upper airway. Some of them will stay there and will create another community or other communities, some of them will go and reach the lung. At this point, uh, most of this, you know, a big subset of these microbes will fly out of our, of our body again through expiration. Or in some other instances, you know, mechanical forces like uh, coughing and sneezing will again uh, throw a lot of these microbes back out on the environment. Now that the ones that they will stay in the lung, they will create this ecosystem, this community or a system. Uh, for example, the bacteria will start replicating, so they will increase the density, and then some of them will die, either because they will be outcompeted by other uh, microbes, or the phages will kill them, or our, our uh, immune cells will just uh, kill them as well. Uh, the phages, again, if they find the appropriate prey, they will start replicating, reproducing. Some of them will die. Uh, some of them will become temperate, which means basically they will integrate the genomes into the genomes of the bacterial cells. And they will stay dormant, uh, until you know, they get some cues and they will get reactivated and go back in the system, or they will die together with their prey, with their hosts. So what we see here is basically we have these uh, feedback loops, uh, and uh, you know, the, the reason why these feedback loops exist is to serve the purpose of the system, and the purpose of the system is to retain its temporal stability or a state near equilibrium. And it is obvious that the interplay between the environment and the lung is an intriguing property uh, with the, you know, the stability of the microbiome. So the stability of the lung microbiome is intrinsically connected with the external environment. A second important pro property of lung microbiomes is that they are personalized, which means basically that how the microbiome changes in time is personalized. Uh, it uh, depends on the different you know, social habits you know, that everyone is doing, whatever we're doing uh, within a day. And interestingly, the, the, you know, the, the social uh, center or the social structure where all these microbes, you know, disseminate between us is basically the household. 
So from this knowledge, what we have learned is that, you know, when we think about fate therapy in complex lung settings and how we can use that, we have to, to know that it's not going to be only about the lung. Second, it's going to be a personalized approach. And third, in order to identify the target, we need to understand how the microbiome is selected. So basically, we need to understand how microbes flow from the environment to the social meta-community, to the individual, and then how specific microbes from that microbiome are selected and are associated with disease. Which brings us to the next challenge, which is basically that we want to use phage therapy for complex systems and not just only one system. Now, another big challenge is what is the actual target? So we want to use phage therapy to manipulate the microbiome, but this is really, really vague. So to demonstrate that, like, and give an answer possibly, like, you know, we have this, uh, this diagram, it's a theoretical model of how changes in the uh, viral or the microbial community can lead to changes, you know, on the type of bacteria that are present there and on their relative abundance or their density. So what we see here is that the transition between the lytic and the lysogenic state of the phages can, for example, allow for a certain microbe you know, to grow inside the microbiome in really high copies. As a result of this, the microbiome will, will, stay, will change to another state. And for this state, for example, you know, the, the host, the human, uh, might respond with a high inflammatory response. Now, if this thing, and of course, this can go the other way around. So it's a, you know, it's a bidirectional process. Now, what happens is that, you know, if these events start happening again and again and again, they will start increasing the probability of happening in the future. So we go in this vicious cycle where, you know, these constant changes on the state of the microbiome will have an impact on the inflammatory uh, response in the lung. Uh, and, you know, we reach a point where we have severe disease, so we will start having, you know, um, a lower lung function as well. And, you know, when we reach the, area, the area of severe disease, this will increase the inflammation, it will increase the mucus and the plaques, so the environment will become hostile for many microbes, good microbes, and it's going to be ideal for a selected few pathogenic microbes. This will lead to exacerbation of the disease. Uh, most of them will be related to a viral or a bacterial infection. This will lead to the use of more antibiotics and, you know, uh, more uh, antimicrobial resistance as well. So we reach a point where this whole condition, you know, becomes life-threatening. And traditionally, how we think about phage therapy is basically a way to manage this crisis. So with phage therapy, and you know, for example, this is how it's being used, uh, to, you know, to fight infection, we try to manage a crisis. So we're hitting, or you know, we're trying to target a select few single species. But you know, when we're thinking about manipulation of the microbiome, essentially what we're going to do is, way, is go way below you know, that point, before that point. We want to go and dig into the microbiome at the point where we can still manipulate it. And basically, w this is the use of phage therapy for disease management and not for crisis management. So as you can see, the target now for uh, you know, microbiome uh, management is basically to break uh, this, uh, se you know, the selection process of the pathogenic bacteri bacteria in the lung. Now, to do that, we need a framework. Uh, and I have actually borrowed this framework or have modified it from uh, a nice book in uh, aquatic uh, fisheries and ecosystems, uh, you know, uh, in feces. And it's really, really interesting because, you know, the commonalities with what's happening in the lung, you know, are great at the system level. So what we have here is we have the ecological system and we have the social system. So the ecological system is basically the microbiome and the environment. So we have the different system components. These are the species or the population of species. Then we have the structure of the microbiome, so really basic properties like stability, resilience, how it behaves in time. And then we have the system functions. So basically whatever the microbes do, what impact do they have uh, on the community itself, but also on the human host. And all together, you know, they provide the system services, and the system services can be bad or bad uh, or good for you know the lung health. So based on the lung health, then we have all the social actors plus the anthropogenic drivers and the anthropogenic activities. For example, you know, using of antibiotics uh, or oversubscription of antibiotics, or you know, where someone lives in a rural environment, you know, or uh, somewhere else. So all that will push back at the system. So we want to use phage therapy basically to manipulate you know this little part of this really, really big ecosystem, essentially. But we have to do that in a way that we constantly monitor how the whole thing will push back. 
So to finish, I think we've reached a point where uh, I think you know, we can use ecosystem-based management uh, approaches, uh, and we can use them basically to build a framework around which we can use phage therapy to uh, manipulate the microbiome. And to summarize, you know, the characteristics of this uh, ecosystem-based management approach will be first to restore, enhance, and or protect the resilience of the microbiome. We need to include complex leakages between different systems, for example, the social, ecological systems. Uh, we need to deal with adequate multiple scales, both in time and in space. And more importantly, it needs to promote adaptive man management of complex and dynamic systems, which means basically that the phase approach needs to be personalized, it needs to be flexible, and it needs to correct itself uh, in time. So it needs to evolve in time, depending on how the, the, the patient will respond and how the whole system around the patient will respond. So this is where we are now. I think it's an exciting time. Uh, and we're in a point where we can start trying these ideas uh, in close collaboration, of course, you know, with uh, respiratory scientists and respiratory medical doctors. And to close as Martha started, <laughs> we can move towards different directions and faith therapy might be the one. Thank you. Right, we're now going to move on to our final panel. So I'd invite our panel members to come and sit up, if that's okay. So we have an amazing mixed panel of industry, charity, and clinicians who are all stakeholders in human health and the uses of phages in human health. So we have Dr. Jason Clark, who's from Fixed Phage. Um, we've got Sruden, who's already spoke already, is from the Leicester Centre for Phage Research. We've got Dr. Waltman and Dr. Halder, who are both respiratory con uh, clinicians from the University Hospitals of Leicester. And then we have, finally, Jonathan Pierce, who's from Antibiotic Research UK. Brilliant. Uh, the mic is in front of you, so if anyone wants to grab it. So we'll just start off with the first question, and then we'll put questions out to the audience. So what I've got is... So for the clinicians on the group, which is Dr. Voltman and Dr. Howder, I was going to say, what are the clinical opportunities do you see for phage therapy within respiratory medicine? Yeah, both Pranap and I um, will probably comment mainly on uh, the implications for mycobacteria and mycobacterial diseases. I will leave uh, Pranap to comment on the improved diagnostics um, which can flow from use of uh, phages. My main interest is really uh, atypical mycobacteria. I'm a TB physician, but I have a large cohort of patients with difficult opportunistic infections due to atypical mycobacteria. And the significance of these organisms is that they affect predominantly people with severely damaged lungs, pre-existing cavities in the lungs, pre-existing smoking-related emphysema, um, cystic fibrosis, which is not my main interest, and uh, non-cystic fibrosis, bronchiectasis. And people who are affected by these infections are really uh, candidates for very prolonged therapy with antibiotics, which is overall not very satisfactory, has a very long duration of treatment, does not always work, and can have lots and lots of side effects, and there's lots of treatment failures. So an alternative for uh, these patients who are in my clinic for several years uh, would be highly attractive. And I'm really excited by uh, Graham Hatfield's uh, Nature Medicine paper and the small series that was published from Pittsburgh where Mycobacterium obsessus, which is the most difficult and pan-resistant organism in this sphere, was treated in some cases uh, with spectacular effect. So we want to get involved here, and I think the, the, the route in, we've heard a lot about the regulatory barriers. The route in is clearly the compassionate use case for people where everything else has failed over a course of uh, several years. So Pranab, do you want to talk about diagnostics and how that... Yeah, thanks, Mr. So, um, so I'm a respiratory physician like Garrett, and I, I work in respiratory medicine, and uh, I help run the TB service. Um, I think... Obviously, phage therapy um, 
has a number of different roles uh, in clinical medicine. Um, we've obviously heard about the therapeutic need, uh, and that's obviously not just about non-tuberculous mycobacteria, it's, it's across the spectrum. Uh, people have infections which are drug resistant, um, people have infections which, although they're sensitive to drugs, are not tolerated by the patients, and thinking in particular about TB, people with drug resistant TB are given cocktails of medications, antibiotics, which cause more harm than the infection itself but are necessary in order to, to treat the infection. So the, the therapeutic need is obvious. Um, but phages do have a role in other aspects of clinical medicine. So diagnosis uh, is an area that we've been working in. Um, and we've been working with Kath Reese actually, uh, in uh, developing her assay for use um, as a clinical diagnostic for TB. So she spoke to you earlier this morning about uh, the phage, the active phage treatment, which has been used um, as a diagnostic for bovine TB uh, to detect uh, that infection in cattle. Uh, we've used it, we've trialed it in humans, and have shown that it's got a potential diagnostic role um, in, in detecting TB. Um, and what's interesting is that this assay offers uh, the potential to be able to detect the infection in the blood where previously it hadn't been possible. And I think what this illustrates is that phages um, offer a way to enhance the specificity and the sensitivity of, uh, of molecular assays that we use to detect bacterial infections. So there's clearly, um, as a proof of principle at least, it shows um, a tremendous potential. And the other area, of course, that, uh, that Spruden was sort of referring to, which uh, I know was discussed earlier today as well, is the idea of using phages to alter the microbiome, uh, a sort of uh, editing technique, if you like, um, which may have a preventative role um, in terms of uh, controlling disease, in terms of potentially preventing disease uh, in the future. Um, but of course, that's uh, a way away. Uh, but there's clearly a huge amount of opportunity uh, in clinical medicine w with, phage, uh, with phage, phage research. Yeah. Thank you both. So our next question I had was for Jonathan Pierce. So it was kind of, I know you work with a number of groups that are interested in, a ha well, people and individuals who have antibiotic resistant infections and they're very interested in support and where else they can get therapies and things. How do you think they will receive phage therapy or whether they come to you as that as an option? That's interesting. Yeah. Um, is it on? Yeah. Um, yeah, we, alongside the research that we fund and do, we, we have a patient support service that um, is used by lots and lots of patients every, every day, every week, every year. Um, the majority of those, that 60 odd percent, um, have complex and recurrent UTIs, but we also work with a lot of um, people with respiratory tract infections. So there is, um, for those patients with resistant infections, many of them have essentially reached the end of the line and they are looking for um, for hope, really, um, in, in any avenue they can find it. And we often get asked about phage therapies and the potential, can they access them and so on. So I think there is that interest and that demand. Um, I think there's also, I think Josh alluded to it in some of his, um, the papers he was referring to, there's, a, there's an issue about managing the expectation about um, what's realistic, what's achievable, how, how this, this will work. So I think we are very supportive of advance, advancing research and access to phage therapies. And obviously, we've covered it a lot, haven't we, in terms of accessing through compassionate use and so on. And if, if that's the way and that's the way, that's, uh, we'd like to see that made more accessible. I think it, patients would also like to see um, more targeting and more involvement in what those research priorities are, what the choices are around um, how we progress this and how we can um, speed up bringing phage-based therapies to the, to the market. So Spiridon, so for you and for Jason, I was going to say, what do you think are the major hurdles at the moment for use of phage therapy? Um, well, I can say uh, some things about, you know, the respiratory microbiomes anyway. Uh, so as you know, the lung is a very difficult uh, system to study uh, in vivo, but also in vitro. 
So we definitely need uh, in vitro models, uh, you know, of microbiome. So we need to be able to culture whole microbiomes extracted from uh, patients, uh, and then the lab we can go and see these really basic uh, properties of you know stability, resilience, or how the system behaves, and how it will react, uh, you know, if we throw in uh, a cocktail of phages. Uh, which it's not gui necessarily guiding towards, towards only one type of bacterium, by the way. Um, so that's one. The second one is uh, we need appropriate and well-designed longitudinal studies. Um, so we need uh, longitudinal cohorts where we'll be able to, to look uh, temporarily both in short-term periods of time and in longer periods of time, uh, again, the microbiome and the, um, yeah, the interaction between you know, the lower airways with the upper airways and the environment. Uh, and of course, there we need to, you know, bring in the, you know, the aspect of uh, the social interaction. So perhaps, uh, you know, sample microbiomes from uh, uh, members of the same household, etc. So we need to, you know, to broaden, let's say, this, uh, you know, area of research and include other other principles, uh, other disciplines. Um, and uh, the third one, I think, is, uh, you know, to push, uh, you know, the sequencing technologies, uh, you know, and overall, you know, the uh, wet lab. Uh, and dry lab pipelines that we use, uh, because we need to, you know, to go to the point where we uh, get to the strain level identification uh, with, uh, you know, with high throughput sequencing. So we need to dig deep in the system, but at the same time, you know, we need to look at the system, you know, uh, more globally. Let's say. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So just as an introduction, I'm Jason Clark, the chief scientific officer at Fixed Phage. So Fixed Phage were mentioned by Raj a couple of times. So we do quite a lot of work with Ventry Health, but um, I also did quite a lot of work with Josh in the early stages of the grant application and help him out with the phage piece for the uh, work he's been doing with diabetic foot ulcers. So if you catch me afterwards, I might be able to answer some questions on that, but I can't promise anything. You better speak to Josh directly. Um, in terms of the, the challenges and, and opportunities for phage therapy, I mean, I, I would probably just be reiterating quite a lot of what's already been said, particularly um, you know, not just this meeting, but every phage meeting that we've had for the phage innovation network and every phage and the science and technology committee review as well, manufacture is um, a big issue. And, you know, Josh has got systems set up in terms of um, understanding the regulations and ability to distribute phages and um, formulate phages for um, at least compassionate use or named patient use such that if GMP phages were available now in the UK, he could be giving them to patients tomorrow. That's, that's the one limitation that he has just now. Um, but of course, GMP, f and, and not just the manufacturer, but help, for example, with process development and formulation, you know, that kind of innovation center that you might, in an ideal world, be dreaming about happening for phage. Um, you know, that helps industry, both veterinary and human health as well. You know, and that's, that's really where I think the bottleneck is just now. Um, historically, regulatory has always been a problem, and, and there are um, a problems, probably the wrong word, maybe a, a, a challenge that hasn't been fully understood. Um, but over the last even couple of years, certainly in human health, there's there's been a lot of clarity, um, which has come about strangely by speaking to the regulators and listening to what they've got to say. <laughs> and um, you know, I think now both for named patient use in the UK and for proceeding to clinical trials, because this working in a phage company, clinical trials are what we're ultimately aiming for. I think the regulatory pathway is actually reasonably clear. Expensive and difficult and something will go wrong somewhere, but reasonably clear. And so the one area I think that that really needs support in the UK, and you're probably looking at some kind of public-private partnership, is manufacturing, formulation, innovation, that kind of uh, hub or centre would be a huge benefit to everyone working in the field. Thank you for that. Did anyone else want to add anything more before we go out to questions? Yeah, there was just one point I'd make around the uh, use of phages for treatments. Um, obviously, we have the opportunity to uh, use phages in, um, in a compassionate use case scenario. Uh, what I think we need to do better, perhaps, is to exploit that in a way where the data that's being collected from those cases is standardized um, in order to be able to compare and to learn from the experience um, so that whatever we take to regulators, um, it provides a strong evidence base. Sorry, 
to <laughs> re-respond to that comment. But um, uh, one of the, so I don't know if the, the work that's been done in Australia, um, they have been able to collect some of this data and have much more flexibility. The, the, when we were speaking to the MHRA about the, the, the work that Josh has done, by far the, the most difficult conversation was with the clinical trial unit and they were insistent that we did not know a clinical trial to the extent that any data that we were collecting or had proposed to collect, they stripped out. And so that, that is a, an area where I think the regulations could be improved, you might say, because it seems somewhat silly to be doing these studies and not being allowed to collect even basic data like phage counts for, for the, you know, we were only allowed to say this patient in the opinion of the clinician has got better or hasn't improved. We weren't allowed to collect any data at all. So that's, that is, a, it's a good point and that's, that's an area where I think the regulations could have some flex to help things along for sure. Anyone with a hand up? Perfect. So we've heard on a, on a few occasions that one of the bottlenecks is like GMP. And so I would like to know if there's any, any scope or any appetite for um, protein-based therapeutics like endolysins and enzymes targeting cell wall components in, in bacteria. Because that, that's, that's in the literature, right? There's, there's loads of examples, and yet none of, none of the people presenting anything today has mentioned uh, the use of those enzymes as enzybiotics, so is it, is it a myth or is it in the background? What do you think? Yeah, people have been talking about this over lunch, so... <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's, it's great to have a networking meeting like this where you speak to people who have these ideas, you know, uh, within Leicester as well. So, uh, yes, I think that is absolutely an op opportunity we should investigate simply because administering, I suppose, a protein, a defined protein, is much easier in clinical trials. Um, but there's still a lot of work to be done, you know. I mean, all forms of therapy with lung disease and complex lung disease, as described in, in, in this talk, uh, faces the challenge of delivery, you know. How do you actually get what what you're using into the right place at the right time, at the right frequency, uh, and how do you monitor the response? That, that'll be challenging, I think, with lysine and with whole phage therapy. You know, that'll be the main barrier. Do you want to say anything else about lysine? No. Anyone else? Bottom side? Oh. Um, thanks for all the talks. I guess from people inside the NHS and for people in PP, private industry and, and also regulatory kind of NGOs, what is the cost barrier going to be for any use in the NHS? So this is never going to be cheap therapy, is it? Plus manufacturing. Someone told me it was, what, 700 or a few million to set up any manufacturing plant, for example. So, um, anything done to GMP is expensive. I mean, phages are probably on the lower end of the the, the kind of process development you might have for GMP. And um, the the, the only way you can really make it you can you can't do GMP phage for a per one person. You have to have a library of phage that's produced the GMP that you can go into and pick out. You know, so you make 10 litres of phage and you freeze dry it and then you can go back to that and apply it to a patient. Um, and so you build up a library of phages. So, so, so most of the therapies are either cocktails or come from this GMP library. Um, and then you might occasionally have a, a, an outlier where you can use, you know, ideally a non-GMP phage that can be, be produced quickly in response to a very specific infection. Um, the... The, the, the Health Improvement Scotland report that Josh mentioned, that's got some um, healthcare, healthcare economic analysis in it. And they found that it, it was economic to use phages in um, critical diabetic foot infections that haven't responded to antibiotics. But they only looked at preventing amputation. They didn't look at um, the number of days spent in hospital, for example, and how much money was saved by getting the, the patient out more quickly. So that, that was actually quite a compelling argument for the, the benefit in that one particular instance of, of um, um, using phages. And, and that was independent of any 
phage people getting involved, essentially. <laughs> so it's a fairly third-person review of it. Yeah, just I want to add on the subject of cost effectiveness for the mycobacterial diseases, I think the UK has a unique opportunity here because I don't think there's any other country where every mycobacterial isolate from the clinical work is uh, fully genome screened, you know. So we get the full genome on every isolated mycobacterium across the country. This is a tremendous achievement, you know. So a lot of that cost is already absorbed and we have a very detailed information about the offending strain in every in every case. So. Any more? Any comments? Um, I'd like to ask a, a bit of a left field question. Um, so we have some good evidence that phages work well for difficult to treat infections. What are the barriers to go for a randomized control trial for an easy infection to kind of get, get the evidence from a trial? Um, yes, I, I, I don't know an easy infection is a good answer. <laughs> but um, to give you a, a, an example, um, if, to put my fixed phage hat on, we are looking to move more into human health. Um, and one of the things we're looking at is diabetic foot infections. And so we've spoken to a number of diabeticians and clinicians um, and, you know, sketched out some clinical trials and what they might look like. And... Um, you know, it, nothing is easy in the clinical trial space, but I think for something like diabetic foot, where there's a, a um, fairly well characterized pathogen set, and there is a, the, you know, the. It's one of the easier, probably, ones to go for. And again, topical application, so great for phages. And, you know, our plan is to kind of not address the critical infections, but address it a little bit earlier on. And you don't want to go, in the first instance, we're not planning to go too early. It's almost prophylactic because that's a trickier clinical trial to do, but kind of catch it at some point between the two extremes where you've got an established infection, but it's not, you know, the critical point where there's no other option to use. And so that's, that's kind of what we're aiming for. It's not a, a, a brilliant answer, but that's kind of where that fits into the whole spectrum of clinical trial and compassionate use. Hi, I'm, I'm Chris Breitling. I'm a respiratory physician as well. So I, I want to extend this discussion around the clinical trial space. So I can understand how where you have resistant infection, you have almost like an orphan disease type phenomenon where you have small numbers, you can go for high cost, and you can probably keep it in the kind of manufacturing model that you're describing. But if you, if you were going to take it more to the kind of model that Spiridon was suggesting, whereas actually you could be using phage to then manipulate the ecology and then alter trajectory of disease, you're then, you're then talking about sort of major pharma kind of studies where you would need very large long-term efficacy studies. So is there, is there hunger from major industry to get involved? And if not, what's the barrier? As the industry person, I guess it's probably here. Um, I, I, I think it's increasing, uh, I would say, because um, I've worked in phage for t 20 and a few more years, um, and the, the change in how industry, and to some extent, I guess, funders, VC um, companies that look at phage has changed even in the last five years. There's a, there's a lot more interest. Um, I think there there is, but we still hear the same kind of, oh, we, we don't know if they work because you've not done clinical trials, so we can't give you money to do clinical trials because we don't know they work, kind of circular arguments that have happened. And and really what's needed is a success somewhere. And that, and that's where it, you know, it comes back to trying to pick something as straightforward as possible in the first instance to show in a good clinical trial that that they work. And then I think all of a sudden people will become more interested in phages. 
and you know it's interesting the microbiome piece as well I was at a microbiome meeting um, about a month ago and uh, the one talk about phages uh, that, that I gave but quite clearly a lot of thing, the people who are doing faecal transplants for example were using phages to control the microbiome they just weren't outright saying that you know there were bacteria and phages in the preparation so they're both having an effect I think so in terms of microbiome manipulation I think the two ends of the spectrum the very specific phage end and the holistic kind of um, traditional microbiome man man manipulation end are going to come together and I think that's going to give us opportunities as well um, so I think there's there needs to be a good clinical trial that is well controlled and works in a relatively straightforward indication combined with like the expanding interest in phage through um, the need to tackle AMR and manipulate microbiomes more efficiently. So just the, I think when we're talking about the, you know, manipulating the microbiome, we have to think phage therapy as part of a much bigger system. So because obviously it's, you know, having an appropriate phage cocktail, for example, is important, uh, but knowing, you know, what to target and most importantly, when to target, I think this uh, contains, you know, other, diff you know, many other elements uh, in the system. For example, you need appropriate sensors in the system and these sensors, you know, they need to, you need to, you need to get data uh, from the microbiome, you need to get data from the human host. So, uh, and of course you need appropriate algorithms that be able to predict and say, okay, uh, you know, from these 10 patients, I have three patients that, you know, uh, you know, their microbiome is at this state and it's gonna change in the following uh, five, six months. So let's try, you know, apply now phase therapy and see, you know, what's gonna happen, for example. That's very oversimplistic, of course, but, um, and, you know, at the same time, you need to, to be able to produce the appropriate cocktails uh, for that patient. So I think, the way forward, not necessarily the only one, but I, I would place phage therapy as part of a bigger system, something that is end-to-end. -end. So it starts with uh, monitoring the, the patient, getting the data, doing the predictions, uh, preparing the phage cocktail, apply the phage cocktail. So I think it's more appropriate, you know, in terms of something like, a, you know, could be a company or something, you know, uh, around that framework, for example, you know, to have this end-to-end -end, um, service, uh, basically. So yeah, just to just to help with the conversation. I mean, uh, I'd say it's very early days yet for phage therapy, uh, and I think that the the empirical need, as Jason highlights, is we need to make phage therapy ethically acceptable. I don't think we've even got there yet. You know, at the moment, it's all about compassionate use. It's you know using it as a last ditch effort to do something to to help the patient. It's got to be ethically acceptable, and for that we need. Uh, we need it to be accepted, acknowledged by regulators. Um, and I think if we get to that stage, then it's a case of, yes, doing the clinical trials, doing them in large enough populations to show that it is an effective treatment. And we can, you know, then the, 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 the whole area can explode. You know, you can try in all different sorts of infections, different stages of infections, different types of infections, and then try, start to understand exactly where the place of phage therapy is in the sort of spectrum of pharmacologicals we offer, we offer, we offer patients. Um, but we haven't actually got to a stage where phage therapy is ethically acceptable. Hi, I appreciate we're kind of at time really, so I don't know if you want to discuss this later, but, and I hate to push the clinical trials thing, but the MHRA are used to dealing with rare diseases, right? I'm really interested as to why clinical trials and the perception of the regulator not really understanding phage is like a really interesting one to me because you've got lots of, like we have to do clinical trials for rare diseases that are incredibly rare, but we still, like having that limited patient population isn't a barrier. And also there's all sorts of like crazy things that come through the regulator, like systemic bacterial, like cancer targeting bacteria and oncolytic viruses and things like that. So I'm, I'm just really curious as to why phage is this I, well, it's such an issue. I'm not quite sure. I don't know. Who, I don't know where the. I don't know why there's. I don't know. I don't know. I, it's, it's probably like a naive question, but it's just because I, I work for the regulator, but I'm at the science. I'm a scientist, so I don't do any of the regulation stuff. But I just find it really. Yeah, I don't understand why there's this problem. <laughs> 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 well, I am being naive, aren't I? 
I don't know, like, what? Well, I don't know, I don't know. It feels like it shouldn't be so difficult. Like, the fact that clinical trials team were telling you not to collect data for a clinical trial, like, well, that doesn't make any sense, it doesn't make any sense to me. I don't know why they would... I'm not saying they didn't say that, I'm just saying I'm curious as to why that that was their response. It's weird. So, so that, that wasn't a clinical trial, that was the, the named patient application of phages. And, and right. actually, they were, they were pretty clear that they weren't worried about what we were doing because they understood that what we were doing was the genuine compassionate use of phages or a, a medicine. They were worried that if they set a precedent that someone else could then come along and say, well, those guys got to collect that data doing named patient trials, so we should be able to do it. And it might be one of the, the big nasty pharmaceutical companies who was coming along and doing it. So, so it wasn't, you know, they didn't want to set that precedent that in compassionate use named patient trials, you were allowed to collect what essentially amounted to clinical data. And actually, one, one of the, the, the case study that Josh put up, it took us a little while to to um, get their agreement that we could publish that, because at first they didn't want us to publish all 10 patients in a single paper, because that was getting too close to a clinical trial. The so MHRA? Yeah. So I just find that really weird. And, and, the, and the, we were able to, that was their first opinion. We went back and said, we think this is a bit, you know, we, we think we yeah. should be able to publish it, because we didn't collect any data, so it's clearly not a clinical trial. And they then agreed. But that, that was their initial response to us wanting to publish the paper. And I, I can give you, probably best, maybe if you wanted to speak afterwards, but I can give you only the insight that we have tried to follow the rules as they have been presented to us by the MHRA yeah. at every step. Yeah. In, and, and that's that's where we've ended up. And, and there are routes for compassionate use and clinical trials, uh, you know, licensed product development for phages, definitely. <laughs> and the reason that there's not licensed phage products out there is because no one's been able to figure out how to make money doing them essentially. You know, that's what it comes down to. No one will pay for the trials because they don't think they can make money. Yeah. And that's why I think we need public-private partnership of some kind to support the manufacturing and formulation and development piece. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, we've got one more and then this will be the end of the session. Um, so just following up on the clinical trials, um, all of you, no doubts, probably um, listened to the evidence um, at the parliamentary inquiry. And I think it was really interesting what the Americans are doing in terms of their clinical trials, in that the phage, for phage therapy, you need to be able to tweak, right, as you're going. And that's what the Americans have allowed. So it's, it, there are several barriers, clinical trials in this country. And it's not, and, and, and it's actually, the MHRA is one of the biggest. All right, thank you everyone. So that brings Sue a close. <laughs> what we're going to say. And then we're just going to hand over for Martha so, like, for our closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you. So. <laughs> Um, first thing I have to do is just uh, thank, thank you all for, for coming to today. It's been a, um, pretty much um, the entire phage biology in half a day, <laughs> so well done <laughs> for bearing with us. But I think it's been a lot of really fruitful discussions. We've aired many uh, different aspects of, of how phages um, are used, how they could be used, what we could do to use them better. So first of all, before I forget to say my uh, thank yous, it's important to thank the Food Safety Research Network, um, Innovate UK and the University of Leicester, and all the people that have worked <laughs> quite hard behind the scenes to make this event happen. Um, particularly, actually, I'd like to acknowledge Jill Thieke, <laughs> who's been incredible, who I work with closely, and it was, as you might, many of you received emails from her to... Um, to, to come, and, and also Fran, who's <laughs> worked in incredibly hard. Um, so I tried to pick out some themes as, as we went along to try and bring, bring things to, a little bit together and, and round them up. And I, I think we could see that there's a, a universal um, agreement that 
uh, the phages of, of the efficacy um, of phages. So we heard from various different speakers. So Ali at the beginning, uh, George, Anisha, Haraj, Joss. So, so I think there's we, we we've seen um, uh, at different scales um, efficacy, whether it's a small scale or uh, Anisha had uh, 2,000 birds. That's not easy to process that number of <laughs> animals. The entire lab was tasked with uh, s s some aspect of processing the samples, and um, Anisha basically gave everyone chocolate and in exchange for <laughs> working till two o'clock in the morning to get to process all this data. And, and as, she, as she said, we, so we, we can see evidence on, on larger scales um, that, that phages can remove pathogens when we want them to. Um, if used appropriately. We also saw that there, there's a real need. I think when all of the different panels were asked, well, what, what's the need and what are the opportunities? There's, uh, again, universally within the, uh, with all the sectors, there's, there's man, many needs where antimicrobials are not either available or getting to the right areas. Um, we then started to discuss uh, the challenges. Um, so the challenges, as far as I noted down, include uh, f finance, regulation, uh, production, perception, policy, um, complex biologies, ethically acceptable um, treatments. So th there's a lot to uh, unpick at and, and work at going forward. Um, I mean, first of all, the first step of, of, of addressing challenges is always to identify them, so <laughs> I think we did well there. And we started to a little bit discuss some of the, the practical ways to go forward, so we started to discuss that you know, clearly we need to, to work with end users, so whether it's um, the end users, end users in, in a human context, as we had in that last panel, or um, the farmers, um, we need to know how to design products that are compatible. I mean, I always have these discussions with Mel, because there's often a, a, a sort of a phage biologist's ideology, but then there's real, the reality of the healthcare structures that, we're <laughs> that, we, that we exist within and want to work within. Um, and we haven't even touched, I just discussed briefly with uh, Chris over, over, over lunch, the, like, how, do we, the, how do we make a phage that, that's potentially um, patentable so we can attract investment uh, or, or alternatively how do we go how do we try to develop other economic models to make phages um, accessible to, to the masses um, we also started to discuss about the fact that we need a we need to have a, a post a post use surveillance so we're actually in a really unique opportunity um, s sort of setting at the moment where we haven't used phages on a wide scale so we can figure out uh, right from the outset we, sh we we could have stewardship programs to make sure we don't just make exactly the same make mistakes that we've made with antibiotics I mean arguably the way that antibiotics have been um, misused is a, one of the sort of great cr crimes of the <laughs> of the last century you know we had this perfectly good medicine that works and we, we have not really taken into account of, of how, how we've used them and we might we are and that's it was lovely to hear from Mandy about how you know, I think that uh, many users are incredibly responsible however as soon as you speak to I was just in Manila last week and talking to all the students there about they've all lost relatives through um, AMR infections and you know that within the agricultural systems there, there there are no controls they can just buy what they like and use what they like and re really they are and they've been used on widespread um, level within um, agriculture and of course that will feed back and you know we travel I dread to think what my own microbiome is like <laughs> having spent a week you know <laughs> interacting in a kind of fairly overpopulated uh, city um, so I think we so anyway we just started to discuss the, these types of things um, no. we um, yeah, we heard from Stephen about some of the opportunities being a bit more positive. <laughs> Within the UK RI now, there are um, many opportunities. I think that I've noticed there's at least six opportunities in Cross Council and MRC and BBSRC. So I think there are many opportunities for, for putting phages forward. So I think one thing we can do going forward as a community is make sure we put, put in really strong proposals, work together to, to make those, those um, proposals uh, strong and... Um, suitably all-encompassing. I mean, I like the, the people have mentioned a couple of times the, the Australian model um, of the way that they're trying to move phage therapy forward. Essentially, they've just joined up, as far as I can see, and from talking to Jonathan Iredale, they've joined up all the different people who are interested in using phages in a clinical way, and they're working together to make sure that they all th the data has been collected systematically across those, those systems. So you know, we, we're a much smaller country than Australia. They've really got, <laughs> they've got a lot of problems with scale and tra transportation and things. We should be able to manage that in our in our country and um, and there probably are opportunities um, within our 
within our regulatory systems, especially at the moment. I mean, I was incredibly upset, still am about Brexit. I marched to the Parliament to try to get a second vote. Um, but there probably are some, as the policies are being rewritten, we, you know, we, we have an opportunity to be able to write informative policy that we can try to progress the technology. So I will end uh, my remarks with uh, just going back to, I thought Rack had the most beautiful, he was his for <laughs> slides of, of the day with his um, penguins and a fantastic ambassador for Leicester. And I agree that w with his sentiments that we need to garnish, garnish the energy and the motivation, use, use the problem to motivate us to work together because it shouldn't be beyond us to uh, solve a lot of these uh, problems, although it's beyond me to turn the page <laughs> of my uh, thing. Um, so I think there's been lots of, lots of food for thought. Um, we can all reflect on, um, on, on the different discussions and think about our own parts. Hopefully people have you know, made new people to, to network with and throughout the day. Uh, we're all very open <laughs> in terms of uh, lots of ways to go forward. Um, Fran, we did discuss the idea of doing an, another event next year. Is that a possibility? <laughs> <laughs> so, so maybe we can we can regroup next year with our, with our reflections and uh, hopefully and uh, if there's enough demands and interest. So, yeah, stay, stay in touch um, and uh, hopefully, yeah, so ho hopefully you will enjoyed uh, the day. I certainly did. Uh, thanks again, <laughs> and I'll sign off. <laughs>